dire wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Welcome, everybody, to another wild, feral day. We never know what we're going to get in the roulette that is open forum debate via Twitter spaces. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, my hour over on Lord Voldemort today. It was a lot of fun. We got into some deep stuff that um, actually, for whatever reason, I never got into, got into that over there. Uh, seems like I would have done that, but for whatever reason, I didn't. So... Um, as the people roll in, if you would hit like and share, uh, as you guys know, this is open forum. The way it works is anybody who wants to come on uh, can present whatever arguments they want, but please make them arguments. So um, you don't have to do arguments in debate. You can ask questions if you want to. Uh, just let me know at the beginning if you want to present an argument or if you just want to ask questions. I'm fine with whatever. The purpose of this is not to be mean to people, not to humiliate people. Um, but we also don't put up with a bunch of nonsense. So if you bring a bunch of nonsense, you might get some nonsense in return. But if you want to present an argument, if you want to present a, a case, why you think X, Y, Z is the case, maybe it's Islam, maybe it's Protestantism, maybe it's Calvinism, maybe it's Arianism, Evangelicalism, uh, Paganism, Platonism, whatever. You can present your case. I will give you the floor. But if you don't make arguments, I'll call you out. So that's how it works. So if you want to present something, within reason you can't talk for five hours straight you can't monopolize everything it's not a machine gun spam opportunity for you to spam quran quotes right it doesn't work like that we had last time i had a dude trying to do that last time right presenting an argument just present your case or 
you know, orthodoxy is wrong because it doesn't have this, this, this. Uh, you know, it contradicts in here, here, here. Uh, the Bible's no good because it says blah, blah, blah. And here's the reasons why, blah, 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 blah. Right? That's it. That's all you got to do. So we don't need um, your psychological reporting, right? Like the atheists always come on and they tell us a story. Okay, We're, we're not interested in a story, dude. We want to know the arguments, the reasons for why this or that is true or false. Everybody understand that? The difference between an argument and reporting a psychological state or giving your feelings, your desires, your impressions, whatever. If you want to uh, say you think I've done something wrong or criticize me, I don't care. That's fine. You can say whatever you want. I, I'm uh, tough-skinned enough and have done this long enough that I'm fully aware that there's plenty of people who don't like what I do. So you can say that. I don't care. Just make the arguments. Just explain in a reasoned way why you don't like this or that. Now, and re real quick before we get into this, with Matt Fred, uh, I don't hate Matt Fred. I don't dislike Matt Fred. We reached out, I think, uh, in 2018 or 19. Um, I talked to Matt Fred, and, and Matt's response was this very sort of condescending, Jay Dye will never be on my show. Okay, that's fine. But, uh, you know, nobody was rude to you. Nobody was uh, uh, talked down to you or anything like that. It was just friendly uh, exchange, asking questions. And usually with the Roman Catholics, that's the way it goes. We, we reach out, we ask them if they want to do something, and then it turns into this you know, this condescending smug kind of thing where it's like, uh, no, here's all the reasons why you're a bad person. Okay. Well, even if I'm a bad person, even if I'm like the worst person out there, none of that has anything to do with whether what I'm saying is true or false, whether the arguments are good or bad. And I think at a certain point, you know, people don't really find that convincing anymore, especially if we've had a theistic Molinist, uh, if you want to come on the Twitter spaces, you can. So we have an open forum. Um, let me see if I, oh, I forgot to put the link in the, the show description, didn't I? So let me add the Twitter spaces link for you guys. Uh, so if you want to come on and ask questions about tag, I, for, I forgot to put that in there too, by the way, but that's kind of a, included in there under the atheist section, right? I mean, the atheists always want to debate tag. Uh, so guy in the chat, theistic Molinist, if you would like to come into the Twitter spaces, you're more than welcome to. All you got to do is come in and hit request to speak, and then you will be allowed to speak. So there's the Twitter spaces. Let me add it to the show description. <clears throat> I'm sorry. My allergies are so bad today. <clears throat> I can <clears throat> out of it. This they're like, uh, they're like a level nine on the chart, dude. And the grass allergies are the worst. <clears throat> okay, so um, there's the link on Twitter Spaces. Remember, guys, uh, Twitter Spaces doesn't work on PC, I think. You have to have the Twitter app. So uh, if you want to come on Twitter Spaces to, to argue or whatever, make your case, debate, you have to do it via uh, the Twitter, uh, Twitter app. So... Um, and I think Father Deacon is here. Welcome, Father Deacon. All right, so uh, we'll kick it off with our first requester. And again, Duncan, you're welcome to hop on after uh, Thaddeus Boone. Uh, what's up, Thaddeus? How you doing today? Just hit unmute when you come on. So it automatically mutes you when you come on, and then you have to hit unmute. Guys, remember, hit un unmute. Testing, testing. Yeah, I can hear you. What's up? Hey, how are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Mr. How are you? Dyer. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm well. I'm well. Good. Looks like I'm a bit of a fish out of water in this conversation. Why is that? Uh, quite a lot of uh, orthodox here. A little bit of... Uh, could be. Yeah, probably in the... But, I mean, we got a lot of... So, you, you're you're Roman Catholic, right? You said you're returning Roman Catholic? Yes, yes. Uh, returning Roman Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I wasn't uh, too into the faith growing up. Um, kind of went through a atheist nihilist phase decided i was going to get back into it mm -hmm. well i couldn't say decided you know I, I feel like something worked on me I, I feel a lot different than i was and i came back to it sort of how i was mentioning to you um i, I think protestantism is pretty much untenable right uh so the choices to me became either catholicism or orthodoxy so i won't disrespect anyone here it's definitely been something of interest to me orthodoxy uh, but I do have some, I mean, we can get into it all later. I, I do have some stuff that I would like to say sure. as we go into this 
is it Cantante Domini or Domino? Yeah, so uh, I mean, we were kind of briefly discussing in DMs. I think you had put up you put a screenshot up uh, regarding the Catechism, the New Catechism, which set which speaks about the relationship of people outside the Catholic Church to the Roman Catholic Church, right? Yes, I actually have that in front of me also. Right, and my response to that was that the point of the discussion today, where I was kind of uh, critiquing Matt Frad and then bringing up the Uniate stuff, was to say that from my vantage point, it's a con it's a, a contradiction in the Roman Catholic system that on the one hand, you can have people who were considered heterodox and schisma schismatics and heretics for centuries, such as Gregory Palamas, Mark of Ephesus, um, all the Russian saints that the Uniates uh, venerate. Uh, because, you know, all the way up into Vatican I, Vatican I specifies that if you disagree with Vatican I, which clearly all the Orthodox do, and that puts you in the status of schism. And if you read uh, Leo XIII's encyclical Satis Cognitum, it points out that one, um, one uh, is unmute. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought somebody was telling me to unmute. No, I'm not muted. Um, uh, rejecting one of the dogmas puts you outside the Catholic Church. So you can't reject any of the dogmas. And certainly the whole history of the Russian saints for the last thousand years has been out of communion with the Bishop of Rome. And the reason I brought up Cantate Domino is that it's one of the older, clearest dogmatic statements where in Denzinger 714, it, it points out that no matter what good works you do outside of communion with the Roman pontiff, even if you shed your blood for the name of Christ, you cannot be saved unless you remain in the bosom and in the unity of the Catholic Church. Now, in Dictatis Pape and in Unum Sanctum, it further specifies that that communion is so strong that it's only in the communion with the Roman pontiff. So the fact that Vatican II in the New Catechism temper this and try to uh, you know make it more you know palatable uh is just further evidence in my view that the the roman catholic church has evolved and changed its position so that was what the argument was and the way to see that is both through cantate domino unum sanctum dictatus pape and the attitude uh, of the roman catholic church towards the uniates and towards uh eastern saints that for century have been considered schismatics but now they get the magic wand that, oh, okay, no, actually, they're still saints, right? So Matt Frad wears a T-shirt of, uh, you know, Russian saints, and, it, and it's like, well, but your church says that people who reject the papacy are schismatics. I mean, that's what Vatican I says. It says you lose your salvation. So clearly, all, how, how, are, how is it the case that you can be a saint outside of communion with the Roman pontiff as a schismatic, uh, and at the same time, Cantate Domino says that you can't be a saint outside of communion with the Roman pontiff as a schismatic? That's a lot to unpack. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I do a lot of discussion with uh, kind of Vatican II adherents and also sedimentatists. I'm, I'm somewhat in the middle. I would, I'm would. i definitely not a sedimentatist, if you're familiar. I am. Uh, those that believe that the uh, Pope is is not actually the uh, in the chair of St. Peter. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm familiar. I, I had that opinion at one time. Right. Many of them, I, I believe, would say that Paul VI was the last Pope. Um and that's a whole different conversation. Well, they mo most of them say that it was Pius XII, not Paul VI. Pius XII. Does he proceed? Um, yes, he does. Moot point, but yes. Um, and, and there is some interesting stuff about that, but I won't go into it. When I talk to them, um, I get into this conversation about how authoritative certain documents are. Uh, dogma, for example, like an actual dogma would be something that is binding to Catholics. And by the way, I'm probably not the best person to be discussing this, just so everyone knows I'm a, a very layman, I'm very new back into you know learning about this, but it's something that uh, has been of interest to me. So I'm not really familiar with Contante. Uh, right, so it's it's a, a papally approved from the Council of Florence, so it's dogma. Okay, so... It's Denzinger I, number 714. So when I look at what's considered a dogmatic definition... And when I talk about Vatican II with people, for example, right? Like, I had family members who are still adherents to Vatican I. They will not take communion in the hand. Um, they kneel when they go to get communion. Well, hold on, hold on. Still adherents to Vatican I. Your whole church still adheres to Vatican I. So you, what do you mean? You have to adhere to Vatican I. It's not, it's not something, it's not replaced by Vatican II. So what do you mean? Well, okay, so from my perspective on this, and again, this is like me coming at this kind of new, but trying to understand it, is that there are things in Vatican II that 
quite clearly contradict things in Vatican I. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had kind of an issue with that, and so when I was talking to these set of contest and trying to sort of hear their arguments, right? Um, the reason they're set of contest is because they believe the entirety of the council is dogmatic, and uh, I don't think that that's the case. Well, uh, that's true, but the dogmatic statements of Vatican II are infallible. So, uh, now, I'm going to grant this because uh, I'm looking here on Wikipedia, right? So, like, take that for what it is. A uh, list of dogmatic definitions. You've got one from Nicaea. You've got one from Ephesus. You've got one from Chalcedon. One from Constantinople. Doesn't matter what, Nicaea. no, sorry. Nicaea I'm too. sorry. Wikipedia, yeah. ha- Wikipedia has nothing to do with this. So, I can give you uh, four or five Roman Catholic documents pointing out that Vatican II is something that you have to adhere to. Well, even Pope Francis would say that. Pope Francis would say, uh, paraphrasing here, but he said that it, he, he said that you're not Catholic if you don't uh, uh, agree with Vatican II. Yeah, I know, but it's not just Pope Francis. It's also Paul the Sixth. It's also John the Twenty Third. They all say that the the definitions are irreformable, and you have to hold to them. Okay, so when they say that you have to hold to them, are they saying, and the word is binding, these beliefs are binding to Catholics? Correct. Yeah, but but I mean, even if uh, there were elements of Vatican II that you showed were ordinary magisterium, you still have to hold to the ordinary magisterial teaching. It doesn't matter what, even if the status is non-infallible, it's still binding on you. That's Catholic dogma, according to Casti Canubii. So Vatican I and Casti Canubii, Pius XI, point out that you don't have the right as a Roman Catholic to reject the teachings, even if they're merely ordinary, so that they may not be magisterial. Right. Are you familiar with the, ca- the categorizations of extraordinary magisterium, universal ordinary magisterium, and ordinary magisterium? Those are the three possible categories of Roman Catholic teaching or dogma, right? It's going to be in one of those three. Right. So the so first, the, hold on, hold on, hold on. The first two are infallible and under the charism of Petrine guidance, according to Vatican I. The third one, just the ordinary teaching, is not infallible per se. However, the Catholic has the duty to submit to it with docility. So even if you think it's wrong, you still submit to it. So it doesn't really matter which category various documents of Vatican II fit into those three categories because you still have to submit to all three of them. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I'm certainly less familiar with those categorizations than you. I'm sure you've been doing this for quite a long time. Well, they're all from Vatican. They're they're outworkings of the teaching of Vatican I. So Vatican I is where we have the clarification, the fact that both the extraordinary and the universal ordinary are infallible. Okay. So, I mean, I haven't entirely been swayed by that. Um, Obviously, I'm operating under the position that the things that are binding are that which is said is binding things that are like ex catholic right so but let's let's dogmatic. just right so let's just take that position um do you, does it make sense that as an individual roman catholic that it's your duty to then sift through all these thousands of pages of documents to figure out which ones are which uh well no i would say no i'm kind of a self instructor in that regard i think it's the job of the clergy to really uh, interpret these things. Okay, well, how do you uh, know? Since, but, but the local, the clergy that you're talking about are not infallible, are they? No, they're people. Okay, so how do you know that the fallible priest or catechizer who's catechizing you in RCIA is getting it right? You don't, do you? Until you. Well, sorry. So, uh, so be- isn't it? So, so how do you shut your brain off? Don't you still have to go and study and see? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, okay, I mean, so I then it's up to you. There's definitely RCIA catechizers who are. Getting it wrong. Okay, so don't and don't sometimes the bishops get it wrong too. Yeah, a bishop could get it wrong. Okay, so just saying that I leave it up to the clergy um, doesn't really solve the issue of how do you, as an individual Catholic, know when you're sifting through the documents that you're putting them in the right categories. Well, well I don't mean to, uh, you know, have you misinterpret me. I say the role of the clergy is to interpret these documents. I don't think the laity is unable to do that, um, but I do have some trouble, and this is why I sort of was, you know. I don't want to say flirting with sedevacantism, but why I was sort of discussing this with sedevacantus is because there are things in Vatican II, which if we're to hold that as a dogmatic magisterial document that... Yeah, like, I know. Nostra Aetate, right. Right. So if that's fully binding, then there are things that are at odds in Vatican I. Obviously. Yeah, but well, the point is that 
uh, both the Vatican II adherents and the set of Acontists are both wrong and right. So the set of Acontists are right that there's contradictions, but they're wrong because Vatican I says that there will never be contradictions and that the Roman See can't defect. So if the Roman See has defected, then Vatican I is not true and the set of Acontists are wrong. Well, uh, the gates of hell cannot... Uh... Will, will not win against uh, the true church, right? So Right. So that means that the Roman Catholic Church is not the true church. Because the hierarchy is in error or, or because the church itself is in error? Because That's the Roman I mean. See has defected, which Vatican I says cannot happen. Hmm. Well, I've uh, given you my spiel as far as I know it. I'm still going to sit here and listen. There's a there's a like book I said, I, there's a book I recommend yeah there's a book I would recommend for you it's called uh, the set of a Contus delusion by a friend of ours John Pontrello um, and we helped John I mean in part it wasn't all me but we helped John become orthodox out of set of a Contism. so he wrote a book about set of a Contism, making this point of showing how the set of a Contus are right in that Vatican II clearly teaches a different doctrine but the Novus Ordo adherents are right in that you can't reject an ecumenical council and the 70 plus past years of uh, ordinary teaching of Rome. Because if you can reject the last 70 years of the teaching of the Roman church, then the Roman see has defected for at least the last 70 years. And it also shows by default that if set of a contism is true and you've had no Pope for 70 years, doesn't it prove the Orthodox point that the papacy isn't necessary for the church? Uh, that's a tough one. You know, there's more of this that I have to look into. Um, and, and you've made some good points for sure. But, uh, I, I mean, my current position, of course, that you've probably discerned by now is that I'm not a set of a contest and I'm not a Novus Ordo guy either. I'm more of a, um, uh, you know, when I look at Vatican II, you say that, you know, these things are. So are uh, you like a SSPX? That's, that's like the middle position, right? Uh, I mean, I'm definitely closer to SSPX. Like I said, I'm a returning Catholic here. Right. And so, you know. It's something that I'm trying right. to currently work out for yeah, myself. Yeah, I understand. I, I would probably be closer to SSPX, but I'm not like formally affiliated with them or anything like that. Gotcha. Well, I would say too that so I went through a lot of these same struggles and issues. I, I went to the SSPX Latin Mass for many years, and the problem with the SSPX is that their position kind of hinges on um, what you're arguing that Vatican II um, isn't dogmatic. It can be dispensed with. It can be classed as mere opinion. And the easiest way to refute this is to just point out that if you read Vatican I, so I would recommend go to papalencyclicals.net, read all of Vatican I. It's about 15 pages printed out. You will notice that Vatican I does not limit the charism of infallibility to uh, extraordinary magisterium. It actually includes ordinary magisterium as well. And that's the death knell. That's the kill shot to the SSPX position. Okay, well, I'd be interested in discussing this more with you. Uh, sure. I know that when I talk about things that like I know a lot about and I'm just kind of like fire hosing people, it's like they take bits and pieces of it. Same here is like I'm hearing all the stuff you're saying and I'm not absorbing every single bit of it, but I'd love to talk about it some more. And uh, before sure. I turn my mic off, I was wondering if you'd let me read this from the uh, from the current catechism. Yeah, just one just second because I'm going to... Just for the yeah. sake of the joke. Yeah, we'll let you do that, uh, but just real quick, I'm going to put in the chat beneath this for everybody um, the stream that I did addressing the status of Vatican II. So you can um, see this whole live stream, and I'm going to send you a, a direct message as well of this talk. I also did a talk on the John Pantrello book too, so if you, um, if you want to either read that book or watch my stream, you can. But there is uh, underneath, uh, guys, underneath this... Um, Space at Twitter Space. You'll notice I just pasted I just pasted in my live stream. Was Vatican II infallible? And if you want uh, the four or five documents where I demonstrate that it is, uh, it's it's linked in that video. So you go ahead and read whatever you want. Okay. So uh, reading the Catechism. This is a newer one. I'm on page 222. Uh, the subheading is Who belongs to the Catholic Church? And this goes from 836 to 839. All men are called to this Catholic unity, Catholic with a lowercase c, so universal, of the people of God, and to it, in different ways, belong or are ordered. The Catholic faithful, others who believe in Christ, and finally all mankind called by God's grace to salvation. Fully incorporated into the society of the Church are those who, possessing the Spirit of Christ, accept all the means of salvation given to the Church together with her entire organization, and who, by the bonds constituted by the profession of faith, 
the sacraments, ecclesiastical government, and communion are joined in the visible structure of the Church of Christ, who rules her through the Supreme Pontiff and the bishops. Even though incorporated into the Church, one who does not, however, persevere in charity is not saved. He remains indeed in the bosom of the Church, but in body, not in heart. The Church knows that she is joined in many ways to the baptized, who are honored by the name of Christian, but do not profess the Catholic faith in its entirety or have not preserved unity or communion under the successor of Peter. Those who believe in Christ and have been properly baptized are put in a certain, although imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. With the Orthodox churches, this communion is so profound that it lacks little to attain the fullness that would permit a common celebration of the Lord's Eucharist. So I'll end there, and that last bit is actually from Paul VI. Right. Uh, in 1975. Right. And that, that is the post-Vatican II uh, re, 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 uh, revision uh, of how to temper this idea of no salvation outside the church to where it's more amenable to groups that were previously considered schismatic. So my counter to that would be that if you read uh, Leo XIII's Satis Cognitum or Mystici Corporis of Pius XII, he says that um, even rejecting one dogma, right, is enough to remove a person ipso facto from the body of the church and the uh, public bodies of the orthodox church the monophysites or whoever they have for centuries been publicly excommunicated by rome and for centuries publicly not been a member of the society of the roman catholic church and so the argument is just simply that uh, yeah, I understand that the new catechism says that, but if you read Cantate Domino, which in Denzinger is number 714, it states this, the Roman Catholic Church firmly professes and believes and proclaims that those not living within the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but Jews, heretics, schismatics, that all of these cannot become participants in eternal life, but will depart into the everlasting fire unless by the end of their life they have been added to the flock. The unity of this ecclesial body is so strong that only those remaining in it and uh, are the, to, to those remaining in it are the sacraments of the church beneficial for salvation and do fastings almsgiving and other functions of piety and exercises of christian service produce eternal reward that no one whatever almsgiving he's practiced even if he sheds his blood for the name of christ so this is not talking about invincible ignorance it's talking about people who are martyrs in schismatic and heretical groups even if they're martyrs for the name of Christ, they cannot be saved unless they become reunited and remain in the bosom of the, the unity of the Catholic Church. So that is consistent with Cantate Domino, I'm excuse me, with Unum Sanctum and with Pop, Dictatus Pape of the medi medieval uh, Latin view that you have to be joined to the papal church to be saved. But this has been tempered in what you're talking about in terms of Vatican II in order to prep the way for the idea that there's a common monotheistic religion. This is why Francis and the Vatican now promote the Abrahamic faith center of Chrislam. We're joined with the Muslims together in a common monotheistic religion. Do you see that in the quote that you read from the New Catechism, it speaks, it speaks in that very way as if we are all united to Christ in a uh, certain degree that there's concentric circles and degrees of union with the Roman church. Jay, Jay, sorry to interrupt you. What was that you were saying about uh, Abrahamic faith center? What now? Yeah. Uh, look up the uh, Abrahamic faith center that uh, in Abu Dhabi that Francis and the uh, grand Imam together are promoting. Oh, well that's uh, disconcerting. Anyway, uh, I appreciate the opportunity and you having me on. Sure. Uh, obviously, I've got a lot more to go through here. Uh, like I said, new guy. Hope I did no problem. Uh, any no, kind of justice to this. No, great but, questions. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, you're asking the right kinds of questions, and you'll notice nobody, nobody was mean to you, nobody mistreated you, nobody's here hating you, um, and I welcome questions like that. So um, really appreciate that. That's, that's how we would like to have conversations with the Roman Catholics. That's a model conversation there. Duncan, what's up, dude? How you doing? Just hit on you. How you doing? Oh, Jake, can you hear me? I can. How you doing? Well, you man. Hey. What's on your mind? Oh yeah. So um, just to preface, um, I'm from South Africa, um, so it's 
but thank you. So I can't stay on for too long. I wish I could. <laughs> uh, um, as I mentioned, my private demon view, I think you're a great guy. I do enjoy your work quite a bit. Um, I'm a fairly new Catholic convert. Okay. Um, I've, uh, I haven't even been... Um, I haven't even been, uh, what's the word, uh, confirmed to the church yet. So that only happens next year, April. So, um, yeah. Uh, what What did you What did you convert What did you What did you convert out of? Um, no, a hardcore um, Pentecostal Protestantism. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I was very deep into that. So yeah, it's a big leap, but um, it's pretty fantastic just to dive back into Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, no, it's. Um, I have a ton of respect for um, Protestantism, but yeah, just um, the, the the choice between um, Orthodoxy and Catholicism to me it was a no-brainer. I mean, um, it's my love and respect for this just so much greater than Protestantism. But yeah. Um, so so why why was it a no-brainer? What what did you think was so compelling about Rome? Um, about Rome, uh, I, I think my first um, let's say that how I first delved into the issue was. Not necessarily. I didn't approach it uh, as in the idea that there are only two options, and that being Protestantism and Rome. Um, I first thought of it as a cool listen. There's there's Protestantism, then there's there's obviously Rome, and then there's obviously Orthodoxy. Um, Okay. Right. So for me, the first thing was to eliminate, uh, uh, let's say, to question my current beliefs and why am I Protestant? Why am I Protestant? Why um, why have I been uh, like in this sort of uh, church setting my entire life and mm-hmm. uh, what's keeping me away from um, or either uh, Catholicism or Orthodoxy and um, to me the the big uh, let's say you can say the slash was obviously um, just the overwhelming um, uh, I don't know just um, church um, it's sort of like the uh, attestments of the church fathers, just in regards to baptism, the Eucharist, and just as well as um, the final death blood, which right. just so the scripture. It was something I couldn't get my mind over. It was the cause of many sleepless nights. But right. yeah, I, um, it, that, that was mainly the main reason that I moved away from, um, what do you call it, um, from Protestantism. But yeah, like I said, I, um, I'd i love to chat about that now uh, for hours, but um, it's almost 12 o'clock here in South Africa um, and I, we did briefly chat on uh, DM um, just in broad mind right and you said you, t- you said you um, took you took issue yeah. well so I was more curious about what made you choose Rome over orthodoxy um, but you said you wanted to talk about uh, you take issue with my approach so feel free you can have the floor and say whatever you want cool yeah thanks I appreciate that man I, that, that, it means a lot to me that we can have this um, still discussion even though we might disagree on whatever but um yeah, I think um, well, mainly what I took issue with was uh, like I I know I'm guilty of it quite a bit. I'm not perfect in that sense, but I do try to be more ironic with my approach to people I disagree with. Um, I resort quite easily to being um, either too way too defensive or whatever, and I just feel like that that's that's kind of what happened with my uh, replies. I was merely pointing out um, the fact that um, I don't necessarily agree with the way. Um, let's say um, Matt Brad was labeled as a fraud um, I'm not, I can't really speak to his character and if you, if you say um, if what you say about um, how he responded and got back to you and when you reached out to him for debate um, yeah I, I'm not too sure what to say about that well so but, again uh, so like yeah. uh, two or three years ago when we had mentioned in comments that you know we'd love to chat with Matt or whoever the response from Matt was the condescending, um, Jay Dye will never be on my show, uh, which, you know, my feelings aren't hurt. It's not that big of a deal. It's just like, okay. I mean, w- w- what did we do that, that you know, to, to Matt that would that would require that kind of response? And, and Matt gave the impression that it was because of the heated debate with, uh, with, with Ibarra. And what a lot of people, again, don't know is the background of these situations. So most of these people, nothing about Matt, but with uh, Loft and Ibarra, you know, I've, I've interacted with those people for a long time and, and we've interacted in DMs and this kind of stuff. And everything typically begins in a friendly way. And I think people, uh, you know, we what we find is that people who don't want to engage the issues, they have a tendency to want to um, turn it into a personal issue. So that's an easy way out of actually facing up to the actual topics of debate is to just say, oh, he's mean, he's rude, I don't have to engage with him. And it's, to me, it's all just like, 
it's all passive aggressive and just very like avoiding of the actual issues. And so like, I mean, how long can you keep milking the thing that I mean? Right. I mean, yeah. they've been saying this for four years. They're still saying, acting like I've never done a public debate that's formal that I, that I haven't debated Trent. I mean, it's not like that, right? It's not like they're pre presenting yeah. it. And all of that is just a smoke screen to have an excuse to not ha actually have a discussion or a debate. So, um, I don't just, I mean, I don't just go out and just start making fun of people and try to get people mad, right? Especially if it's a high profile person, like I would love to have those conversations. And the reason I call Matt uh, out on that is because just like what Lofton and Ibarra were doing, they present themselves as if they're not polemical. They present themselves as if it's a neutral sort of talk show that's open to these different, and that's just not true. They are polemical. Uh, so number one, you should be, ob be honest that you're being polemical, right? So it's just yeah, that yeah, it's that but, simple. So yeah. that that's all it is. I mean, I mean, if Matt has a, I mean, he lists himself as having degrees in, in philosophy. So I mean, if Trent can step up and debate, well, how, how come Trent doesn't get his feelings hurt? How come Trent debates me with without a problem? I mean, did Trent and I? I mean, did Trent go home crying? Did he get his feelings hurt? No. I mean, so if if atheists and Muslims can debate. Uh, how come the Roman Catholics won't debate? Like, why are they, why, why are they so uh, uh, soft that... But, I mean, m by the way, they say the worst imaginable things about me, right? So they say everything you could think of about me. I'm a Satanist. I'm a sorcerer. My wife's a witch. I mean, they've been saying this stuff for years. Do I Have I ever said anything about Matt's uh, wife or girlfriend? Have I talked about any of these people's... Uh, I mean, I have made fun of Erica Barra's size because it's gargantuan, but... So what? That's a joke. I don't. I don't try to expose Eric's wife as a sorceress or something. I mean, that's just crazy. But this is what these people do. So you know, they they. It's just such a ridiculous double standard, and they And and then what they do is hide behind a cloak of piety. That they're they're too pious to do these kinds of things. They're too pious to actually engage with uh, someone as immature as me. And yet, at the same time, we see people from their sphere doing the most immature and ridiculous things. So I don't feel bad about saying, no, Matt, I think Matt Fratt is misrepresent he's misrepresenting his, uh, what he stands for because it gives the impression that you can, uh, you can be orthodox. You can be orthodox. Look at me. I do everything the orthodox do, but I have Rome. I've got the papacy. And I think that's a misrepresentation because the argument that we continue to make here is that uniatism itself disproves the Roman Catholic Church because it allows you to have differing views, reject ecumenical councils, and say you're a Roman Catholic, just as long as you accept the Pope. That's it. That's that's. I think that's a misrepresentation. Yeah, um, I think the unitism um, argument is interesting. It's not something I'm uh, very familiar with, so um, I wish I could engage more on that um, in regards to my knowledge. But uh, it's definitely something you've given me something to research, which is pretty great. Um, so thanks for that. But sure. yeah, um, my, uh, I think the, the reason why, uh, let's say, I... you there? Hello? Can you, hear me? you cut out barely. Am I back? Can you hear me? You're back now. Go ahead. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. So I think the reason why I got back to you and I deemed you is just, um, I think it was, I, I felt like I said something on Twitter. I just sort of pointed out my concern, just in terms of I don't know. It it, it, it didn't feel like um, some of the comments were necessarily ironic or aimed toward, towards peace. Um, where I would state something, just like my concern with um, the way something was presented or um, said, and then the response would be, um, "You guys are emotional, also emotional," and um, I. I failed to see you like where I would make I'm, I made a statement where I was overly emotional or um, where I uh, sort of uh, well what I, what I mean is that the, yeah. t the tone policing relies on emotionalism that's what I meant by saying that Roman Catholics are okay. so emotional in these issues because it either turns into uh, people who are, are trads and ready to debate or it's the people who piety signal and talk about how um, they're too pious and beyond debating, and uh, you're just so mean to Eric, and you're just so mean to Matt Frad. Um, I, I mean, again, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm mean to these people. I mean, I think it's a it's hit for tat scenario where 
I think they've been actually a lot more, their circles, maybe not them them personally, but their circles have actually been a lot more mean. But I mean, okay, so you disagree with uh, the whole idea of calling people out or whatever, that's fine. But I mean, where is the yeah. Roman, where's the Roman Catholic tone policing of the Roman Catholics? Because they come after me and my wife and all kinds of stuff for years. I mean, Lofton has made videos uh, where he takes comments that I made a joke 10 years ago. Uh, and tries to spin it as if I'm this uh, drug addict. I mean, it's just retarded. Yeah, and I mean, if that's the case, I mean, I'll hold hands with you and I'll stand with you. By okay, well, look, let me just say this. I'm a, I'm a, let me just say this. I'm a, I'm a satanic drug lord. I mean, like you said, in the stream as well, doesn't matter. Right, look, this is, but see, this is the thing. This is all, this is all smoke. It's all smoke and mirrors. I'll just go ahead and tell you, I'm a satanic drug lord. There you go. How's that? I'm a satanist drug lord. So let's get to the debate. <laughs> let's get to the issues. Like, it's all deflection. Debating my personal life and debating how mean I am. And by the way, why are people debating how mean I am? If debating is bad, then why are you debating how mean I am? <laughs> okay. I'm a Satanist drug lord. Okay. Let's get moved past that. Let's now get to the actual <laughs> topics. How's that? Yeah. No, I, I understand. Um, and yeah, I, I respect you a lot for um, actually taking up the debate of trend and whatnot. And even though in the past there may have been some rougher debates i mean that i think uh, if, if that's the case with matt fred and michael often uh, if, if what you say is true then yeah i i stand by a side it's not right and, and yeah if i'm consistent then i should be policing them as well but i think in this just this case um, well i mean let's just, just move past that, the, let's just move being, past the tone policing Look. i'm not guilty of I'm, I'm okay being necessarily uh, I, i'm not mad at you do this fine it's okay yeah. it's cool all right it's all good thank you for those comments duncan appreciate it uh, let's see, <clears throat> let's see, Jesse, what's up, dude? <coughs> <coughs> You're talking to the satanic drug lord of the internet. What's up, man? Just hit unmute. Duganist Satan drug lord. This is the Duganist satanic drug lord podcast. What's up, man? Bro, you got to hit unmute. Guys, Twitter spaces mutes you when you come on. Just unmute. All right, he left. So let's see who's up next. Christ Respector. What's up, dude? <clears throat> Hit unmute if you want to speak. Jay, can you hear hey, me? I can. What's up? Hey, what's up? Um, I have a question. It's a debate question, but it's not my position. I just want to see how you would answer it. Okay. Um, so, uh, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing you in any way, of course, but, uh, in the past, uh, you've said that the main proof you would use to, uh, justify Christianity or prove Christianity, uh, and Christ's divinity is the Messianic prophecies. Is that accurate? I think there are strong, uh, evidential arguments for Christianity. Correct. So I'm not a, an evidentialist, but I, I think that, yeah, we have to use evidences in Christianity for sure. Um, and right. yes, I, I think that one of the strongest classifications of evidences is, is the, are the messianic prophecies. Sure. <clears throat> so how would you respond to this argument against that? Um, so the, Council, the councils that compiled the Bible were obviously after Jesus had lived and died, mm -hmm. um, and they were a post hoc justification for the theology they had built around Christ because they could select the books that uh, reinforced the idea that Jesus was fulfilling prophecies and reject books that might contradict that position. How would you respond to that? Well, first thought is that the texts of the New Testament um, far precede any of the councils that discuss canonicity by centuries. So we're not relying on um, arbitrary selections from people uh, at the Sixth Council or at Trollo or whatever. We, I mean, the, the patristic writers for centuries have citations to whatever the early texts were. So if, if even if we don't have autographa, you know, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, these are all early attestations to the veracity of the documents. And if you look at if you look at somebody like Irenaeus, for example, 
early in the second uh, in 180, uh, we have him not just citing many, many, many gospel texts, many, many uh, Old Testament texts as well. We have him referencing the public testimony of the tradition in the churches with apostolic succession. And he chooses Rome as his preeminent example because it's doubly apostolic. And he says, anyone can go and check to see what the tradition is at the Church of Rome, where we have the great founders, Peter and Paul, passing on the apostolic tradition. So um, it's a really missing the actual process of history and patristics for a person to make an argument as if later councils just sort of like secretly, uh, you know, swiped these documents and, and snuck them in there. When you have centuries of church, I mean, if you look up here, I mean, you've got thousands of pages of writings from the first, uh, you know, three centuries prior to Nicaea. And we can look and see what after Nicaea uh, compares in terms of theology to pre Nicaea. And we see that they teach the same things, right? I mean, Athanasius is not teaching anything different than uh, St. Cyprian. St. Justin Martyr is not teaching anything different than uh, St. Basil, right? So people post and pre-Nicaea have a continuity of doctrine, which shows us that the canonicity is something, canonicity is a decision that presupposes some lists of canons. And, and mainline textual scholars will point out that there are multiple competing canyon, canons of scripture in the first several centuries, Right. So, so in other words, the, the, the argument presupposes a process that isn't even correct or accurate with history. Right. So to boil it down, you follow the paper trail back far enough and you're going to see a continuity. Yeah, but it's not just a, it's not just a paper trail. It's also, uh, that the liturgy itself, uh, has, uh, its own sort of documentary evidence presented within it, within the liturgical tradition. There is, uh, evidence within the patristic writings, which is distinct from the liturgical tradition. Um, and there's also the ancient, uh, New Testament texts. So, I mean, there are texts from first, second, second and third century. Uh, we don't have the autographa, but we do have early texts, which show continuity. Right. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, it's great. can I it's ask it because I'm trying to figure out who is this like a Muslim or like a Seventh Day Adventist type of argument? Like, who is the person that makes this kind of an argument? Oh, uh, I don't know. Theoretically, let's say an atheist concedes your point on uh, the transcendental argument for God and says, "Well, I don't believe in the Christian God just because you prove the necessity of a God to ground things." I see. So, just. Yeah, well, I think that, right, but but from. I see what you're saying, but there's an important uh, addendum point to tag, which is that the transcendental argument doesn't prove any kind of God, it proves a certain kind of God, and so that's why I make the argument that it proves the Trinity, it doesn't just prove, like, generic God. Gotcha, and I'm, I'm sure I can look up one of your transcendental argument videos and hear you, uh, uh, yeah, so if you want more, so if you go to the video that we did critiquing Phaser, uh, Universals, uh, comma, Phaser, comma, J. Dyer, that talk gets into why the Trinity is the precondition for knowledge, ethics, and metaphysics. Okay. All right, I'll look into that. And I, by the way, I covered it in the last stream, too. So the first 20 minutes uh, or 30 minutes, I covered the Stan Eloy book, um, Theology in the Church, which has a whole chapter on why the Trinity is really the ground of reality. Okay. Cool. I'll look into that. Okay. Um, Anything else? Uh, just a concluding comment. Sure. You know, I think it's a little disgraceful you didn't include Louisiana in your Southern States video. Being that we are the best, being that everyone wants to move here, <laughs> I expect a full apology within 24 hours. So, <laughs> isn't, Bob, isn't Bob, didn't didn't, Mom, didn't Mama say Bob Boucher is from Louisiana too? Who? That's part of the reason why we have to be mentioned in any conversation on the greatest states. Bobby Boucher, I got a statue of him in my backyard. <clears throat> He's huge. Here I don't know about that, dude. Dude, I went to uh, New Orleans, and that place was a hellhole, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans doesn't count, okay? Oh, I, what? Uh, that's New like Orleans. the most famous thing in Louisiana. <laughs> you're like, what does it doesn't yeah. count? I disown everything outside of the French Quarter. Okay, the only thing that you get, right, the only thing you get props for in Louisiana is Nicolas Cage's Pyramid Tomb in New Orleans. That's it. <laughs> Fair enough. Do you know, right. you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, are you talking, you're not talking about his haunted house? Well, in he New has Orleans? a, he also bought a tomb. It's a pyramid. I got a picture with it. 
where's that? When you go into, you know how uh, downtown New Orleans has like four or five uh, old graveyards where all the graves are above ground? Yeah. yeah. Okay, if you go to the one that's, quote, the oldest, there's a giant pyramid tomb that he had built, and he or he bought it in there. What? Yeah. I've never heard of that. I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, yeah, look it up. <laughs> hey, another feather in the cap of Louisiana. There you go. Say? That's yeah. That's the <laughs> one point you get is Nick Cage's tomb, so... Yeah. Well, thank you All right. Yeah. Good questions. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Misfit Hippie is back. What's up, Misfit Hippie? <clears throat> hey, Jay. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I can. What's up? <clears throat> so, uh, I have a question regarding. Um, oh boy, I had a few questions. Okay. Uh. Oh, simulation theory. So if you were arguing with someone or you were tasked with debating someone who like is seriously pushing the idea that we live in a simulation, mm -hmm. how would you how would you uh, attack that? How would you go about yeah. that? Well, I mean, it's it. right. So it's very similar to uh, <clears throat> like the ancient Far Eastern uh, ideas of Maya, right? That <clears throat> reality is ultimately some form of like an illusion or a dream or something like that. So one easy way that, that you can uh, critique it is to say, well, if everything in my experience is in some way illusory or, or a simulation, um, then doesn't it seem doesn't it stand the reason that my coming to know that it's uh, a simulation or an illusion is also part of the simulation or an illusion? So it would kind of be self-defeating just on its face. Beyond that, to be able to um, state that everything is a simulation, I think that would run into problems with universal claims. Oh, okay, well, how do you have access to universal states of affairs to be able to say that quote everything is a simulation um, beyond that it seems to presuppose that there's some criteria of non-simulation that you can set it off against or compare it to right so in other words what's the justification for the criterion of simulated reality versus uh, non-simulated reality if everything that we know is a simulation there's really no way to justify or or give a grounding for the claim that Everything is a simulation except for the things not in the simulation. Okay, but so what is the reality then that you that you're comparing it to? Right. So um, the laws of logic you're using to even make the exactly. Wouldn't they? Be, they, would, they would just be part of the simulation. So they're also kind of a, yeah. a, by de they're de facto illusory in, in that way. So I think those are pretty um, pretty solid way. I don't see how. A per and by the way, uh, simulated so by who? Said, like, well in this simulation maybe some people could be granted like gnosis about the simulation and like bring that awareness to other people okay i mean that's a claim but what, what is the how do we go about uh what are the good reasons to believe that right so they can yeah, say yeah. that but we, we need right. good reasons for why we should believe that not mm -hmm. just not just sort of uh, mystical speculations so really the simulation theory is just like another version of like platonism or ancient maya philosophy or something like that so um, you could also probably make critiques in terms of, um, I lost my train of thought. I had another a criticism you could make of that view. Well, the other one you could do is that a oh, good loving God wouldn't allow something like that to be, mm. well, um, uh, well, be deceived on such a universal level. Right, no deceiving demon like Descartes. Like Descartes, yeah. Those. And, and also, you might yeah, could... so once you establish, like, you know, uh, the transcendental argument for the existence of God, somewhat like Descartes, you would say that, well, look, um, either you just resort to absolute silence because of the skepticism that you just had to go into, or you say that, you know, if anything's going to be known at all, then it'll be known because of the transcendental argument for the existence of God, and God wouldn't allow for something like that to happen. Mm. Yeah, right on. Oh, I, I also, <clears throat> uh, I'm not positive on this one, but I'm just sort of thinking it out loud. Like, you might could critique it on the grounds that simulation theory, in my view, is kind of just a way to bring telos back into philosophy. So it's kind of like, let's, it, you know, the, the world, now that we have advanced technology and now that we have computers that kind of like, you know, in, in a profound way, uh, simulate the world, people fall into simulation theory thinking that, because of the you know profundity and complexity of computers it's got to be some kind of key way into understanding the nature of reality 
And my, my point would be at that. So to me, that looks like, oh, let's bring Telos back into uh, our worldview, but let's not have Telos from a god. Let's have Telos from what? Who? The programmers of the simulation? Is that aliens? Is that what is that? Who is that? So we're back at step one of like, OK, so now give me an account for Telos and for who the um, who, who are the programmers of the simulation and how do you know about that? Because to say it's a simulation is a kind of analogy to computers, video games and computers and video games have a designer. OK, and I, I we can we all know that we can verify that. But you're saying that all of reality is like a computer game. So tell me about the designer. Right. And what is the justification for uh, teleology in this in this position? Yeah, and are they in a simulation too? And then it goes back into regression. Yeah. Um, well, or yeah, or or you could yeah you could ask that question and say, oh well, how how do you know they're excluded from being in the simulation? Yeah, right. you, you could ask it that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other question I had is unrelated, but uh, in your experience, like doing apologetics, who? Which like demographic seems the most resistant to orthodoxy? <coughs> seems the most amenable to it. I really couldn't say. I mean, it, there's it's just I don't know. Is it kind of all over the place? Like some Protestants are more are easier to, to convert, and some are harder. So, uh, I mean. In, in regards to feedback, it seems like there's not really any greater percentage of people who were Protestants or uh, Roman Catholics. It seems like we get uh, a large number of people giving feedback from both uh, traditions or so-called traditions, I guess, in the case of Protestants. But yeah. um, right. and, uh, you know, pro I would say it's probably a close tie between uh, Orthodox and Protestants converting and then maybe number two would be uh atheists and muslims kind of tied we've seen a lot of muslims convert but um probably the most amenable are uh protestants and catholics that have an interest in tradition um okay. i think i think roman catholics who are like liberal novus ordo they don't care anything about orthodoxy but yeah. Ro roman catholics they appreciate it on a superficial level but they don't really believe in exclusive truth yeah exactly and and so protestants that are more traditionally minded and conservative minded and Roman Catholics that are more uh, conservative minded are probably the most likely to convert. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, can I ask one more question? Or yeah, sure. Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. So and, uh, I'm not asking for like churches. I know there's not like a dogma about this per se, but asking your personal opinion um, regarding technology. Uh, it's kind of my thought about it is we don't think technology is inherently good or evil it depends on the way that you use it um and god gave us minds to be able to like discern the laws of nature that allow us to uh use them to manipulate them to do work in the worlds right mm -hmm. and that's not inherently bad and it enables like for what we're doing right now you know communication across huge expanses of space etc um but then there's obvious downsides to it that i don't think really need to be stated but uh do you think it is inherently evil or good in some way? What's, what's your take on that? Well, I think our uh, doctrine of creation um, uh, precludes us from saying anything is inherently evil. I mean, right. to, to state right. that anything yeah, is inherently evil would be <laughs> some form of Manichaeanism. So, um, no, nothing is inherently evil, but the evil comes in with the misuse of it. So, no, there's nothing wrong with computers and the Internet, any of that stuff. I mean, unless you want to be a Manichaean. So. Yeah. I guess I could hear, I could see some people saying like, well, like the very act of creating technology is like a prideful human act to try to like overcome the restrictions of nature that God placed on us. But I don't really think that pans out because it's like, where do you arbitrarily draw the line to say like, well, okay, I mean, no so, I mean, so building an arc uh, involves engineering yeah. and technology. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, good Thank questions. You. Sure. Uh, yeah, those are good questions. Um, yeah, nothing could be inherently evil. We would we'd be some form of like Gnostic or something. Sidonatus, uh, what's up, Sidonatus? Just hit on mute. Hey Jay, how you going? Hey, good. Um, yeah, just had a quick question about um paradigm level circularity. So, okay. Um, 
I know that um, once we get to like that universal level of like logic or ethics or something like that, like how do we know that logic is logical? How do you know that your ethical system is ethical? It's like, I think you've said it in the past, like paradigm level circularity is like sort of unavoidable, right? Mm-hmm. And then we need like God who's sort of like that ultimate circularity to like ground all the universals, right? Am I characterizing everything correctly so far? Yeah, I would agree with most of those statements, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I just want to know, what would you say to an individual that agreed, like, if they're not materialists, that they agree in consciousness, logic, ethics, meaning, all these sorts of things, that they're all, like, individual, unidentical, universal categories. Um, but then they would say, oh, but I just believe in them, and I don't um, I don't believe in, like, a God that unifies them, which is the only objection we could bring up, like, the interaction problem of how does something that's, like, dissimilar, like, ethics interact with something that's dissimilar, like, uh, meaning logic is that the only objection because i've heard you say that in the past but is there anything else that we could say to individuals no i think we could say all um, kinds of things i mean we could say we could say for example i mean uh the reason that we need a personal god is because uh we need intentionality and in order to have telos in order to have purpose which is again i think fundamental uh, for a coherent worldview at all you need to have causation you need to have teleology you need to have these basic metaphysical principles um, they don't just, they can't be self-subsisting causes. I mean, what is it, how does it, does it make sense to say that the number, that the universal causes, uh, the world to exist, that, uh, the number seven causes things to exist. They don't do things. They just are. They're not, they're not beings with agency that act to do things according to some intention or purpose. And so, uh, none of the platonic worldviews, and what you're describing would be some form of a, a platonic position has any way to give an account for how forms become uh, meaningful causes. They're just said to be so, and, or they're described as accidental causes that for uh, inexplicable reasons, the monad gives birth to the dyad and then the dyad gives birth to the triad. And then all of the fractal multiplicity of the world just sort of springs out of this. Who knows why it's not done by a personal active agent. It's not a personal God. It's an impersonal emanationism. And that becomes a huge problem. So there's, there's other, it's not the only way. There's other ways. Go ahead. The very best that they have is that you've given some sort of account of how this works, i.e. causation. But that doesn't get us into the category of, um, yeah, but are those good reasons? Like, in, in other words, are they justifications? Mm. Causation never gets into um, the category of, am I holding a true belief for the right reasons? And the, the counterexample I always give is that, well, we could give you drugs or do neurosurgery on you and cause you to believe all kinds of things. And then let's say somebody's in a privileged epistemic position which, by the way, is begging the whole question because this person that's telling you this is pretending to be in a privileged epistemic position, but that's exactly what's in question. We want to know, how do you know that, that these are the cause? So there, again, just like we heard yesterday, it's just people giving their beliefs right. and never getting into the category mm. of uh, justification and giving arguments of how they're grounded in that. But suppose they are in a, a privileged epistemic position. Let's give them that. Again, all they've done is shown A causes B. There's these forms or whatever the else they want to put, the, these laws of logic, whatever they want to posit, causes B, a true thought. But that does, never gets me into the category, yeah, but is that is that good? <laughs> Yeah, this is a great this is a great point Father Dickens bringing up, which is that the critique that I gave to you was a metaphysical critique, right? So I was critiquing, well, okay, you're going to say that the forms do all these things on their own, even though there's sort of impersonal, uh, transcendent things out there, they've somehow become causes. And Father Deacon is making the point that, well, if you were to uh, go with modern philosophy, they wouldn't just critique the metaphysics. Metaphysics is way out of the, you, you got the cart before the horse. Let's get about, let's get into the notion of justification. And do you have good reasons why we should believe this? How, how, how are you justified in telling us that this is the case? We know you believe these things and that's really cool and neat or whatever, but why is that? What are the good reasons that you can give that we should believe that the forms are just these self-subsisting causes of reality? Well, I mean, they could still, the second point was, 
Donald Davidson's point, who actually is an atheist, that says um, it is causation that causes us to have these beliefs. And then he admits, but that doesn't tell us the justification. It doesn't tell us, are we believing him for the right reasons? Right. That's a great point. Well, I mean, the, what, what are the Platonists or whoever is believing these things to the, they could still use similar argumentation to what you guys would use in the sense of like reductio is like if you deny truth. Yeah, but that, deny, like, yeah, but this is what we got into in the last live stream, which is that reductios don't get you to the status of justification. Oh, they, they don't? Okay, no. Well, that, that's, that's, that's used to be. Why, why would you say that they don't? Well, if you read the Mannion paper and if you read uh, the Father Deacon's paper critiquing Quine, both of those papers point this out that, um, okay, so let, let, particularly the Mannion paper when he gets to the uh, circularity and uh, justification. So uh, this is what Roman Catholics try to do this all the time too. They'll try to say, oh, uh, well, we'll just use aerosol's retorsion argument. Um, which is what he did against the sophists to try to prove that you have to presuppose logic, right? And I think, oh, yeah, it's true, but it still doesn't get you to this. It's still not justified. And the reason it's not justified is that it assumes, for example, that logic actually matches up to things in the world. We don't know that, right? Maybe we're just psychologically predisposed as human beings to think that our logical schema corresponds to things in the external world. But we don't know that yet. And that's why you can't just... Uh, this is what Platonists do all the time, for example. Like, if you remember when uh, I was arguing with some of those pagans a few months ago, and there was one of the pagan dudes who was like, I don't need justification, you're a wanker! And he was calling me a wanker because he was like, justification is a question that modern philosophers ask for. That's what atheists ask for. Uh, you're making atheist arguments. But it wasn't atheist arguments. It's arguments that modern philosophy started asking when they noticed that ancient and medieval philosophers had presuppositions. And so it, in a debate, right, I'm not going to just grant you your presuppositions. I'm going to I'm going to ask you for, well, wait a minute. You're telling me that self-subsisting forms cause reality and you've got a lot of uh, fancy, cool metaphysical baggage there for all that. But I want to know if we're if you're justified in that belief. I want to know if you have good reasons why we ought to believe that. I mean, I know you think it's true, but what are the good reasons by which everyone else ought to hold your position, you see? And that's what Father Deacon is getting at, which is that it's more than just giving a, a vast, elaborate, grand narrative account of reality with all this grandiose metaphysics and whatnot. That's what Platonism does, right? But more fundamental questions get asked. They get asked later, if you read uh, uh, Father Deacon's paper on... Um, uh, transcendental arguments in orthodox theology he raises the question at the beginning about aristotle's distinction between that which is better known by us and that which is known in itself and that whole distinction in aristotle is a presupposition well how do we know that that distinction actually is the case what are the good reasons to believe that that is the case and if you just say well i can't conceive of it being any other way or it seems as if that's the only way that's not that doesn't so what that's not good enough that still doesn't grant justification. It's too weak of an argument. And uh, Father Deacon has a, uh, some some great points in his paper where he he just all you have to do is give it counter examples of things like, well, maybe humans are just predisposed to think that our logical categories match up to reality. Maybe we're just predisposed to think that logic works in the world. But does that give us justification for saying that it does work in the world? Because I can't conceive of it any other way. Could you give me could you give me the name of that um, paper and also that Russ Mannion paper as well? I'd like to look them up. The Mannion paper is a contingency of knowledge, and uh, Father Deacon has two different papers: uh, one critiquing Quine and one uh, uh, about Orthodox uh, transcendental arguments. Um, I forget the names of the papers, but they're in the P they're in the Discord in the PDF bank. Uh, I'll definitely check them out. Also, they, they always go with these things that. Oh, the way that I justify it is I do a reductio. Um, and then if you contradict yourself, then that means the disjunct of whatever the position you're reducing to the absurd must be true, and um, I'm justified in therefore believing it. But if you think about it, we could just, you just push the question back f further that, 
well, why is contradiction a bad thing? And why is not contradicting yourself in a disjunction or um, why is that a justification? Oh, because we just all believe that. Or I can't do anything other than that. But again, well, wait a minute. Why Why is that a justification? Well, it's just, it ultimately, it'll ground up because it's just what we believe. And yeah, so, so Father, Deacon, trend, Father so. Deacon brought this up yesterday or the two days ago when we did the other stream and somebody had the same question. And it was like, I mean, you, you can't. So there's the question of what ought we to believe? And then there's the question of uh, the criterion problem. And you can't it's like a chicken or egg scenario where either one you pick will involve the other element of justification. Right. So in other words, you, if you say, well, our criterion for justification is blah, blah, blah. And you say, well, how do you know that that's the criteria for justification? Right. Because that's what we should believe to be justified in our beliefs. Right. So it becomes this circular exercise. Again, it's called the, the, the criterion problem, because if you say, for example, that there are uh, foundational beliefs, which don't have to be justified, the assumption is that you already have a prior criteria to ferret out the foundational beliefs and the non-foundational beliefs. So you have this assumption and the assumption already assumes that we ought to follow that system and that ferreting out. But why ought we to believe that is the choice? But that presupposes that we have the right criteria. So what's the criteria problem for the criteria problem? Do you see how this just keeps, it's the same problem just being restated. And the, the, the point of all this is not to say that there is no such thing as justification for knowledge. The point is to say that the human autonomous systems end up in this circular regression that they can't get out of because they don't have God in the system. That's the whole point. It's not that there's no justification. It's that human autonomous systems can't give justifications because they end up with these arbitrary, self-evident maxims that are circular and self-justifying. And then when you challenge that, they say, well, I can't see how it would be otherwise. Okay, but uh, saying I can't say how, how it would be otherwise reduces to just a psychological description of your perception. So how do we know that just because you can't see it's ototherwise, that that is therefore the only logical position? And that's yeah, so the biographical details of your own mind mean absolutely nothing to the like ontological facts of the universe. Correct. Yeah, that, yeah, so if you read if you read the manual paper, there comes to a point where he actually gets into this. He's like, well, uh, we think logic is the case, right? And maybe it is, but how do we know that the logic that is a, a, in our conceptual schema matches up to the structure and operations in the external world? We can't, I mean, we have to, we assume that, okay? How do you demonstrate it though? Because anytime you try to demonstrate it, you're still going to be assuming that it is the case. So it becomes this sort of, this circular uh, meta level presupposition that we have about the world. And so if we want to have this uh, classical foundationalist, evidentialist approach to things, then we're going to be stuck in a dilemma where we can never solve that uh, criteria problem, that uh, self-evidence problem. That's great, Jay. Thanks so much for that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to ask is, because um, you mentioned that modern philosophers are all about justification and all that, but um, my fiance is taking a few philosophy classes, um, some philosophy of mind classes and knowledge and other things, and um, they brought up the Gideon problem, the Gideon critique a couple of times. And I've looked into it too, and it doesn't, it seems to be to be very shaky to say the least. But what have, do you got, have you guys done any work on like the Gideon critique of knowledge is justified true belief or anything like that? Because I've heard you mention it a few times when I search it. Up well, all know. all that is doing is adding another category that um, it's not enough to say justified true belief. You also have to have justified true belief at time t, because you can give counterexamples to where um, you could have a justified true belief that ends up being false. Uh, and so the, the Gettier problem, because you, because you might coincidentally think that is the case at time T and then at time Z, you end up discovering that it wasn't the case. Right. And, uh, the Bonjour text gives an example of, um, you know, I, I'm driving through the hills of uh, New Zealand and there's lots of, uh, sheep out there and I come over a hill and I see, uh, what, uh, upon the hill appears to be, um, uh, sheep and, uh, uh, so am I justified in believing that, do I have a justified true belief that there are sheep on uh, Hill B uh, in New Zealand? And it would seem to be the case that I can match all those criteria, right? But then I find out that for whatever reason, um, the farmer that lives there decided the night before to set up uh, fake sheep up on the hill to um, distract some wolves or something. I don't know, it's, you know, coyotes are attacking. So he put some fake sheep up. Now, I was justified in my 
I had a justified true belief that it, it, it appeared to be that there were sheep there uh, on the hill at that time. But, but then I find out that no, actually that night it was unique because he didn't put the sheep out. He put the fake cardboard sheep up at the top of the hill and I was driving by at night. So, uh, but the bonjour text gives other examples of count of counter, uh, of just demonstrating that justified true belief, um, also needs a further criteria for cases of, um, coincidence. See, am I retarded? Like, I don't, I don't get it because, like, it's clearly not a justified true belief because it was a false belief. Like, he, he wasn't like. They, no, they but, cheap. but, but it's not. But the point is, the point is that the person is has the meets the criterion of JTB from their vantage point. That's the point, and it still turned out to be false. So the point of the critique is that JTB is not enough. It's not saying that there's no such thing as JTB. It's saying that JTB alone still can you can still have false beliefs that you're justified in so you need a further criteria that's all it's saying i see okay um and would you agree with that what, what would be what would you say is the extra criteria that we need well we don't know i mean no i, the, I, I think we both agree with Gettier. yeah we're like, agreeing with it we, we actually think Gettier has a good argument it's like yeah that's not enough because there's, you know, a handful of counterexamples in which somebody's justified in making an inference. They hold to a true belief, um, but there's something accidental going on. Yeah. How they get it, the true belief, even if they're justified in making the inference to it, is accidental. Right. And we would say, yeah, but that's not that's not knowledge. We we would all agree with that. So. We just agree with the philosophers following up on that. There's some fourth condition. Right. Now, one of the fourth conditions could be um, it can't be an accident. But as Bonjour yeah. says, well, it almost always is going to be so, like, what, what constitutes not being an accident? There's always going to be some variables in there. So it's not quite clear, but it doesn't. It just means there's further criteria that nobody right. has a perfect definition. Um, but we can talk about knowledge. Sure. And we can and talk about just there's a... being a perfect definition. And I found the fourth criteria that it's just like, I don't know. There could be possible cases, but knowledge would look something like this with a fourth criteria that answers those problems. So if you have we the, yeah, so that. let me, let me read. So if you have the Bonjour book, uh, he points out, this is on page 40. He says, 1963, Edmund Gettier uh, published a remarkably short paper that seemed to many to show clearly that the traditional conception was at the very least seriously incomplete. So it's not saying that there's no such thing as justified true belief. It's just saying that JTB is incomplete. And all we have to do to show that it's incomplete, not wrong, incomplete, is to give these counterexamples. And so the first case, here's a good one. Uh, the first case before the sheep example is Eleanor works in an office in which one of the two workers, Tom, drives a Mercedes. Tom talks about how much it, fun it is to own a Mercedes. Um, he wears a Mercedes t-shirt. He receives mail from the Mercedes owners club and so forth. She infers and comes to strongly believe on the basis of the proposition that one of her coworkers owns a Mercedes. In fact, however, Tom does not own the Mercedes. The car has been, he's been driving is a rental and all the other evidence is part of an elaborate hoax aimed at convincing people at the workplace that he owns a Mercedes. In fact, however, one of Eleanor's other co-workers, Samantha, does own a Mercedes, which she keeps garaged and hardly ever drives, and does not mention to anyone, though Eleanor has no evidence of this at all. Note carefully that the belief at issue is the general belief that one or other of Eleanor's co-workers owns a Mercedes, not the specific belief that the co-worker Tom is the owner of the Mercedes, though Eleanor, of course, uh, has that latter belief as well. So there's a, there's a, it's an, it's a lack of clarity in this example between something general as opposed to something specific, right? So is, is Eleanor uh, justified in believing that one of her co-workers owns a Mercedes? Yes. Is she justified in believing that Tom owns the Mercedes? Well, she thinks though, but actually she's not because Tom is involved in uh, grifting and trying to present himself as a player who has a Mercedes, right? And it turns out, no, it's actually Samantha who owns the Mercedes. So a clearer example, I think, is case two. Driving through the country, Alvin sees what he looks like several sheep standing behind a fence behind the road 
and thus he believes strongly that there are sheep in that field. However, there are, uh, there are indeed sheep in the field, but they are <clears throat> sheep out of sight beyond a grove of trees and over a hill. The animals that Alvin does in fact identify are large dogs, um, bred and groomed to resemble sheep very closely. Note carefully the belief at issue is the general belief that there are sheep in the field in question, not the belief which Alvin also has that the particular animals that he saw were sheep in the field. So the, the, count, the examples give cases where both people have a justified true belief, but they were accidental and they were not uh, specific enough, right, where the counter example showed that more specification was necessary to meet the actual justification criteria. So that's what the Getter problem is. The Getter problem is not saying there's no such thing as justification. It's saying that JTB was incomplete. Here's some counter examples. So we, we just need more specification for specific beliefs to be justified. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, th th thank you for that. I know that was a bit lengthy. Um, I appreciate it because, yeah, um, I probably just wasn't yeah, um, construing it correctly in my head, but um, no, that makes total sense. But as to what that other criteria is, that's actually quite puzzling. Well, the yeah, other criteria is specificity of uh, time and place so that it's not an accidental belief. So then would you say that if they said that those particular dog-looking sheep over there are sheep, right? Well, obviously, they wouldn't say dog-looking sheep. They just said those things over there are sheep. Um, then that wouldn't be JTV, right? Because in, in that case, even though they... Well, they the, bel the, belief, the belief was there are sheep in that field, okay? And right, right, right. the point was that he didn't know that. He didn't know that there were actual sheep behind the trees in the field. So he has a true belief and it meets JTB, but it's actually a false belief because what he thought were the sheep, right, were dogs. So it's an accidental belief that happens to be correct. And it, and it, meet, and it meets JTB. So you need more than just JTB. That's all I'm trying to say. That's all. Yeah. 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 So just so we can, uh, just so I'm 100% clear, but if he was to specify and talk about those dogs as sheep, then it obviously wouldn't be a justified true belief, right? Right. He's wrong. He's wrong about that belief. Yeah, he's wrong about that. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, then, yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, I get it then. All right, thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, good questions. Uh, Father Deacon, is there anything else you wanted to comment on uh, that, JTB and Getty? Or, by the way, I think part of the point of what we're saying about JTB and the Getty, it's, it's, there's not like a specific perfect formula, right? There, there will always be an element of um, fuzziness when it comes to, certainty and and how we know for sure that we have good reasons for our belief there, there's never going to be because we, we would need omniscience right to know for sure with absolute godlike certitude we would have to be god but the point is that in contrasting the worldview that we have to the worldview of our opponents we have good reason to believe in justification for our beliefs the other right. positions don't have a good reason to believe in justification at all that's the point it's not, we're not claiming that, oh, we get access to uh, omniscience. We don't, we don't have omniscience, but we have an omniscient God that grounds our system and gives us the possibility of knowledge. It's not saying that, oh, because we have God in our system, it gives us omniscience and we know everything in these cases. That's not what we're saying. Now, one of the you know, a meta epistemological analysis of two fundamentally different worldviews, a theistic worldview. Right and an atheistic one that has purpose and in that story explains how god would do all this why there's regularity in nature and that the future will resemble the past and that um we have reliable mechanisms um ceteris paribus as long as we don't you know do take drugs or something for uh forming these beliefs and stuff now you don't have to that's in the general kind of as far as getting the specifics obviously but the atheistic worldview is accidentalism yeah so that means behind everything the ultimate explanation you have to appeal to the accidental laws of physics i'm giving you an accidental narrative i'm giving you an accidental um knowledge I'm giving you accidental morality. It doesn't make any sense. It's an oxymoron. So what it ultimately boils down to, there is no story in the atheistic story. There's nothing that can be said. 
Yeah. Um, so that's a different though than going, okay, well, if the only way to go is with the theistic story, it's the only thing that accounts for all this stuff. It's a very different, yeah, different question. Well, what exactly is not in the details? Um, what are various problems? And again, there's nothing in principle problematic with just because I can't get the most precise and accurate definition doesn't mean that we don't have knowledge. For example, um, you know, if we thought about a couple hundred years ago, how you would define the color red, you'd have to do it uh, ostensibly. You'd have to point at it, right? Well, you know, the sort of thing right there. Um, now that's pretty inaccurate, right? But that does, does that mean that red doesn't exist because I can't, yeah. you know, reduce it to what is it, uh, seven hundred nanometer wavelength or something like that, and the kind of more of objective scientific definition? No, it's so I would say the same thing with a lot of this stuff. First, you establish well, what can actually account for for knowledge? This can't. Then you can move into the details. Well, now that we can secure that knowledge, the possibility of knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Then we can go into further details and interesting things that come up and getting better definitions and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not, it's not like the dispute between the Christian and the atheist is who has the algorithm that perfectly explains all reality. That's not the dispute. The dispute is you have a worldview where it doesn't even seem like math is even possible. We have a worldview where it at least gives us the possibility of doing math. It's not a claim about the totality of mathematics or the totality of knowledge. It's a claim about the possibility of having knowledge, the possibility of having meaningful experience, the possibility of doing metaphysics, the possibility of doing epistemology. That's a different argument than I have access to omniscience and I can give you a perfect account of knowledge. That's not what we're claiming. We're saying nobody can do that. That's a, that's a, that's a ridiculous request. But we have a worldview by which if God exists and this system is the case it does give an account for how knowledge is possible it's not saying that the christian has the perfect omniscient justification for all knowledge that's not what we're saying okay two different i'm not saying you're saying that i'm saying sidonitus just just making that clear because a lot of times people hear this and they think oh so you're saying that that like you get an appeal to omniscience and that gives you uh like all knowledge of some situation which gives you justification no it's not what we're saying we're saying that God, as the ground of the possibility of knowledge, makes knowledge possible because the worldview makes knowledge possible because it's coherent. It's, it makes sense. Right. And we're saying that when we contrast that with your worldview, atheist, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It, we don't see how knowledge could even be possible in your worldview. That's what we're saying. And further, let's add to we're not saying that atheists can't be moral or atheists can't have knowledge. Right. Again, they can't give an account for it. There yeah. is no story. <laughs> in the atheist story right. about morality or uh, knowledge because there is no story yes having knowledge and, and making claims to knowledge is not the same thing as giving an account for knowledge and, that, and that's what we all we're, we're usually asking for the latter and giving an account for knowledge atheist is not telling a story about evolutionary psychology that's not what a justification is asking for Anything else, I don't? Um, I was just going to ask one final question about sure. um, about uh, uh, Gideon case and JT um, B. Do you think is it possible to have a Gideon case? Um, we have accidental um, JTV in in um, in a non empirical sense, like if if you're talking about something like a priori, like some sort of like a deduction in the mind. Like, is that would you say that's possible, or is it more just when we get into the um, finitude of our bodies and being in the external world and having sense data that those accidental knowledge um instances occur uh you lost me there i don't follow well i think what he's saying is like could this all of those were cases uh, with sense data that were yeah empirical cases could it be possible through inference a priori um well, certainly, all it has to do is meet two criteria, and that was it's too general, either too general and or accidental. Now, could we make a priori inferences in which um, it seems possible that we could do that and still fulfill those 
those categories. For example, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking about in mathematics arguments and modal arguments and stuff like that. I could maybe can conceive, uh, it seems conceivable that there's a greatest prime number. And let's say um, I'm justified in the inferences to make whatever a priori inferences to make that. Um, and then from that, I make a, a, an inference to a true belief about, uh, I don't know, some particular prime number or some number in general. I can qualify it and actually say that, well, yeah, I actually have a true belief that's actually justified. Um, I don't know if that would actually work. I'm, t- I'm trying to just think, it's hard to think of examples off the top, top of your head. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's the way that you accidentally arrive or something's too gen- general but you're holding you're holding a true belief <clears throat> I don't know that's a great question it seems yeah, incredible but I, I don't know yeah because it's definitely it's almost like we get these accidental true beliefs because of just how limited we are and like obviously we're not omnipresent so right. like over here and the, and the sheep are over there over the hill and we can't see everything like God can. And so because of that, we can get that, those accidental instances because of our finitude. But then if you take away the material reality and you're just talking about like some sort of like a reasoning in your mind, like is it still possible to get that accidental thing? I think, yeah, it's, it's much more abstract. And I think it probably well, just could take, be possible. Well, like, just example of Jones and the man who will get um, the job has 10 coins. What is it, five or five coins in the pocket? I think it was 10. 10, okay. Um, Now, we could make that argument without ever sensing anything, right? Just from the opera facts. um, I have a fact that I know that I have 10 coins in my pocket, um, and the person that uh, is going to get the job has has 10 coins in the pocket okay and then what is it what is the I gotta look up the anyways think about that where you're not actually empirically sensing stuff I could take that exact example that Getter uses and just be like okay just assume these are facts a person can deduce that um, a priori and have what we would call a true justified belief and we'd say yeah but they don't know that Jones is the man who's going to get the job. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's nothing about the about Gettier's example with uh, Jones in which it depends on anything empirical is what I'm trying to say. So I think that would qualify. I mean, I said, I'm, I'm sorry to, to be like a bit argumentative here, like, but if you if you've never had any empirical uh, experiences, right? How would you even know what a job is? How would you be able to like construe a sentence? How would you like? Because you learn all these things through the external world, right? So like, I don't know well, how you would be able to make that. Yesterday, um, the Bonjour book, because I'm going to be teaching an epistemology class out of it, and he was talking about like I don't know, two plus three equals five. Um, and he was saying he was ta- Jay, if you remember this, he was talking about. I think this is in the, the problems of induction at the very, very end um, with issues of memory. And he was saying, well, obviously I learned that empirically. But then he says, what we mean by a priori um, means that, yeah, but I can still make the argument without relying on that memory. So, yes, in a general sense, you learn everything in pure or something like that. But you don't have to actually depend on that. Yeah. Is what, what bonjour. And I'm like, that's right. Like, 
there's other ways to figure out two plus three equals five. Or think about geometry. You learn through like triangles. Like, would you ever be able to learn anything about math if if you didn't learn empirically? It's like, yeah, okay, no. But now that that's kind of established, um, you don't need to rely on drawing pictures um, or relying on your memory to prove that a squared plus b squared equals c squared right there's other ways and that's what would what we would call in philosophy is a prior arguments yeah good what question was that for text, so i can um what was that called so i could get that as well and then you can let me go and i've been on your way too long epistemology classic problems and contemporary responses by lawrence bonjour now that's not epistemology. It's not the science of uh, when you get pissed off and give responses. It's epistemology. Just uh, important <laughs> clarification there. Yeah. Thanks. I almost mis misspelled it. Thanks, Father. <laughs> yeah. Good questions there. Um, By the way, I'm really yeah. enjoying the, the the Jay Wood book too. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm gonna. Um, it's too late to put that book into the the college but what i can do is uh photocopy some of the good sections out of there and supplement it to the bonjour yeah i just like that he as i pointed out to you many times but for the sake of the audience the reason um uh, so the bonjour text that father deacon recommends is, is a, a lot more uh technical kind of like a college text that you would you would get in a, an epistemology class and the wood book could be that but it's a little more geared towards kind of implementing christian principles into epistemology so for example um, don't we need to have some idea of virtue uh, in terms of epistemology? I mean, for example, should we tell the truth, <laughs> right? Or, I mean, I could be a secular epistemologist and think that truth has no value, right? So, but for a Christian, no, we, we're going to have, um, our theology will have implications for our epistemology. And I like the fact that he brings that in. So that's, that's why that book is good. <clears throat> uh, let's see what's up. Next is uh, Landon. What's up, Landon? Just hit unmute. Hey. Hey, what's going on? My name's Landon. Are you guys only doing debating, or are you guys taking orthodox questions on an orthodox inquirer? Uh, no, whatever you want. Yeah, I just had a few questions and wondered if you could kind of fill me in on the differences between the orthodox trinity, uh, or orthodox view of the trinity and the Latin church view of the trinity. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the central issue that you'll usually hear mentioned is the filioque, which um, is defined at Lyons and Florence as a double eternal hypostatic procession from the Father and the Son together as one principle. We reject that because we have a, a really precise, clear doctrine that we think is the Cappadocian teaching and, by extension, the dogmatic teaching of the, first sec or the Second Ecumenical Council at Constantinople, which is that the Father is the sole cause in R.K., and so we can't give his hypostatic property to the son. The son cannot share in the unique identifier of the person of the father, which is to be sole cause and arche. That's the phraseology from the Cappadocians. If he's the sole cause, he can't have. Uh, he can't also not be the sole cause by having the son as a co-cause. So that's why we reject the filioque first and foremost. Uh, further than that, though, it gets deeper when we get into the doctrine of divine simplicity. And the Roman Catholic dogmatic acceptance of identity thesis, particularly at Rhymes and the Fourth Lateran Council, which accepts the Lombard doctrine of identity thesis. So those are the strongest statements. It doesn't matter what Aquinas says, and even though he's a really strict proponent of absolute divine simplicity, we're not going to quote Aquinas because they'll all just say, well, we don't have to follow Aquinas. Okay, but you do have to follow the dogmatic definitions. And what we see in the dogmatic definitions beyond uh, Fourth Lateran Council and Rhymes is the acceptance, for example, at uh, Florence uh, of a, again, double hypostatic procession that's based on a doctrine of divine simplicity, which led to filioque. And that's because Augustine uh, f fleshed out in his speculations in Book Three of the Trinity, um, and not just Book Three, but uh, later books as well, and on the Trinity, that. Yeah, in order for there to be uh, a third principle, it has to be a an eternal procession from the first two. And so, unfortunately, we, we do see Augustine making the first uh, Neoplatonic-style argument for the filioque on the basis of his divine simplicity, reductions of person to nature. 
So in Orthodox theology, we always guard the distinction between nature and person and the Trinity. We never reduce the persons to the nature. And unfortunately, we do see that in Augustine. And by reducing person to nature, it led him to think that the only logical way to understand the Trinitarian relations was by relations of opposition. The only way to distinguish the persons clearly, according to him, would be to set them in a relation of opposition. So the Father is not the Son and not the Spirit, and that's what sets him off as a unique person, right? And this leads to confusion. This leads to <clears throat> rejection of the essence-energy distinction. And this is crucial because in the, the councils that set Orthodox theology off against the Roman Church, particularly uh, the Response Council, the Palamite Councils, Black Rene and others, that are responses to the Council of Lyons in 1274, the first Roman Catholic dogmatic statement of a double eternal hypostatic procession. Lyons, excuse me, Black Rene says, no, uh, the texts that speak of the manifestation of the Son are about the energetic procession and manifestation. Roman Catholic theology doesn't even understand or have a place for energetic procession precisely because they don't have a doctrine of the energies. Um, Uniates have a doctrine of the energies, but all that does is demonstrate the inconsistency of Roman Catholic dogmatic theology. The fact that on the one hand, they accept uh, the idea that you can have an energies doctrine and also reject the energies doctrine and be a Roman Catholic as long as you accept the papacy. Uh, but uh, if you look at the Sixth Council and the dogmatic definitions uh, of, of the Sixth Council, particularly the teaching of St. Maximus in Dis Disputations with Pyrrhus, you'll notice that his whole theology, his whole Christology is based on uh, two wills, two operations, two energies in Christ. So there has to be multiple energies, multiple actions, multiple things that God does, both as creator and as incarnate. And so these are all clear ways to distinguish the fact that, no, we teach uncreated grace. Roman Catholic Church teaches that uh, grace is a supernatural created reality. The grace itself we're talking about, and that's in uh, Ludwig Ott, clear as day. Ott has a, a, the first statement on grace, is that grace is a supernatural created reality. We don't teach that. We teach that grace is uncreated reality that we participate in. So again, at every point, whether it's the procession, whether it's uh, uncreated grace, uh, whether it's theosis, whatever, we, when we look at what's actually taught, we see that all of these doctrines hang or fall together, and the Orthodox Church does not teach the same thing as the Latin Church. Clear as day. There is nobody in the Orthodox tradition, no Eastern Church Father ever, 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 none of them ever say that the justification that we get, the sanctifying grace that we get, is a supernatural creature. Not talking about the creatures who get the grace, the grace itself, Roman Catholics. Are you listening to me? It's in ought clear as day. And they just lie. They just say, no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It does say that. He says clear as day, proposition number one, the, in the Roman Catholic view, supernatural grace is a created supernatural gift truly distinct from God. Again, this is page 254 in ought. The first, prop well the first proposition on grace right there, it says it is a supernatural created thing that is not God. The grace itself, right there. Go ahead. So when they, when they, when they say grace, are they saying like the, the created grace that wasn't created by God or that it was created by God, but somehow also distinct at the same time? I'm confused. They're saying that the grace that you get in sanctification, justification, etc., is a creature. The grace itself is a created reality. It's supernatural, but it's a created supernatural reality. Created by God himself, or do they not claim that? Yeah, well, they would say it's created by God for us. Okay, but what is there such a thing as a created God? Well, of course not, no. All right, so when Jesus says in John 17 that he came to give us a share in the glory, is God's glory a creature? I'd say negative now. Correct. So Roman Catholicism is false because it clearly teaches, and it teaches us in Trent too. It says that the justification that we get in baptism in the in the canons and decrees of Trent, the justification that we get in baptism is the righteousness of God, not the righteousness by which God himself is just, but by which he makes us just. So clearly, just like in ought, it is not what God has. It's not the righteousness of the life of God himself. It's a created supernatural reality that's given to us. I mean, that's an Aryan argument. Well, that, that's that's really insightful. I, I had no idea that 
Yeah, but they're just inconsistent because if you ask them if they believe in the real presence, they'll say, yeah. Okay, so what are you eating? Are you eating the essence of God? Are you eating a created uh, uh, grace? What, what are you eating? I'm not talking about the matter of the, of the sacrament. The grace in the sacrament, in the Eucharist. Now, every Roman Catholic has the phrase they'll use, which comes from Cyril, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But the problem is that when I go read Cyril, Cyril believes in the essence energy distinction, clear as day, and he says it many, many times. So according to St. Cyril, it's the uncreated energies that I'm partaking of in the Eucharist. Now, since the Roman Catholic Church does not have a clear teaching on the essence energy distinction, and because they do clearly teach created grace, Roman Catholics, just tell me what it is I'm eating in the Eucharist. What do you think it is? I mean, don't you have to say that it is a created supernatural reality distinct from God? Because you believe in absolute divine simplicity? It can't be an uncreated energy. So what is it? Let the Roman Catholics tell us what it is. Do you think you're eating the essence of God? I've had some, some of them say, yes, you eat the essence of God. The other ones say, no, it's a created reality. Uh, I mean, I don't. we don't have to wonder about this. Because St. Cyril has a whole letter, two letters, two letters to six census, where I've covered many, many times, where he says, I follow the tradition before me. The Council of Ephesus teaches the same thing as Cyril, that what we eat in the Eucharist is the uncreated glory and immortality by which the Son deified his human nature. This, the deification of the uncreated energies that deified Christ's humanity are the same uncreated energies that we get in the Eucharist. It's not hard. It's very clear if you read St. Cyril. And so doesn't that mean that the uncreated energies doctrine is fundamental to our Christology and our sacramentology? Shouldn't that be obvious? And yet, what do they want to do but contradict us, say the energies doctrine is heresy, say that it's polytheism, even though it's fundamental to Ephesus and St. Cyril. It's fundamental to the Sixth Council. Read book three of On the Orthodox Faith by John Damascus. In book three, especially chapter 15, the whole exposition for the next several chapters is nothing about nothing but describing the energies in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in my book, I put a whole chapter in there that the essence energy distinction problem and debate is literally resolved in the Sixth Council and in John of Damascus' teaching. It shouldn't even be up for debate. Well, that, that's really insightful. I appreciate you taking the time to talk. Sure. Good questions. Good day. You too. Uh, let's see. Next up, um, Thaddeus Boone is back. What's up? Unmute. Thaddeus, you there? Hey, Jay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. conversation you were having about the energy and transubstantiation could you just review real quick are you are the orthodox church in favor of the doctrine of transubstantiation or no uh well the phrase transubstantiation can mean different things but uh we don't have a problem with uh of course we believe in the real presence of course we believe that you are partaking of the very divine life and glory of christ himself but what I'm saying is that it's very clear from St. Cyril and the Council of Ephesus and St. Cyril's belief in the essence energy distinction that he's, he's very clear that we partake of the uncreated glory, not the essence of God in the Eucharist. And so you have no way to explain the Eucharist if you don't have the essence energy distinction. Okay, that's something I've kind of sort of studied. I don't really understand. You're, you're cut. You're cut now. I can't hear you. Exactly your point. You're cutting out. I'm not trying to uh, be rude to you, but we, we can't hear what you're saying. So uh, if you get a better connection, you can you can chime back in. So, yeah, guys, look, uh, let's let's review this again. I'm going to have to grab the book because this is a very important point. Let me grab the St. Cyril thing. <clears throat> so remember, guys, that uh, when Cyril uh, makes his arguments, which Ephesus accepts, in the uh, anathemas at Ephesus, we have these very clear statements where Cyril makes his arguments on the basis of the real presence. And he says, Nestorius, you ought to agree with, uh, uh, with what I'm saying if you believe in the real presence, right? So he's trying to corner 
Nestorius on an argument from the sacraments. And in Cyril's theology, what's true of the sacraments, of the Lord's Supper particularly here, pretty much is synonymous with what's going on in the Incarnation in terms of Christology. And so there's two very important letters that we look at when we look at St. Cyril, and it's the two letters to the census because he fleshes out, this is the mature Cyril later in life, particularly what he means when it comes to the notion of the deified body of Christ. We're talking about the deification that occurs when Christ assumes human nature. By, <clears throat> by assuming human nature, he de facto deifies the nature he assumes. How does this occur if, for one, created natures are distinct from the divine nature, right? The divine nature is timeless. It's atemporal. It's uh, timeless is atemporal. It is uh, not in time and space, right? It's not located in one area. It is eternal. It is uh, unchanging, right? And yet we're told that one of the hypostases united itself to human nature. It's not the divine nature that became incarnate. Okay, so you can't stop at Chalcedon. There's more councils that teach us about what happened in the Incarnation. We have to keep going into the 5th and 6th councils because they clarify more about how we're under, to understand the hypostatic union. And the hypostatic union is not an incarnation of the divine nature. It's a divine person with a divine nature assuming human nature. And that is how we avoid Nestorianism. And so later in life, St. Cyril is commenting on this in the first letter to Sixensis. And he says, even after the resurrection, the same body which Christ suffered in continued to exist, although it no longer contains any human weaknesses. We maintain that this body was no longer susceptible to hunger, weariness, or anything like it, but was thereafter made incorruptible, somewhat after the resurrection. And not only that, but the, it is now life-giving as well, because it is the body of life. It is the body of the God-man, of the only begotten. Now it is radiant with divine glory, and it is seen to be the body of God. The human nature of Christ, radiant with the divine glory. Is divine glory created? Is divine glory a created reality, created substance, a created grace? No. There's no created God, as Palamas says to Barlium. That is idolatry. There's no such thing as created gods. There's only two types of things in the universe, created things and uncreated. God is uncreated. Created things are created. That's all, that's all there is. There's no middle thing. The uncreated energies are uncreated. Cyril says, so even if someone should say to me that calling Christ the body divine, as one might call a body, a man's body human, it is fitting and they would not be mistaken. In my opinion, this is what is meant when St. Paul says, even if we have known Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him as such. 2 Corinthians 5.16 As I have said, because it is God's own body, it transcended all human things. Yet the earthly body itself did not undergo a transformation into the essence or nature of Godhead. So the incarnation is not a transformation of the human nature by the divine essence. It is by the uncreated glory. And by the way, if you read Florovsky's essay, Creation and Creaturehood, he demonstrates that not only did St. Athanasius believe in the essence and distinction, but so did St. Cyril, clear as day. So Cyril is making this argument because there's a distinction between the divine essence and the divine glory. The human nature participates in the divine glory, not the divine essence. So here it is, clear as day, in the two letters to six senses. And anybody who reads Cyril would come to know this. It would be very clear. You would understand clear as day the essence energy doctrine in Christology, in sacramentology. And the mere fact that the Roman Catholic Church has confused and lost this doctrine and has no clear teaching on this proves they aren't the true faith. Why, as Baron, Bishop Barron says, do you have to recover the faith of the fathers? As he says in the videos with Cameron Soituzzi, why do you have to recover something if you got it? If you have to recover the faith of the East and the faith of the fathers, then that sounds like you lost it. And again, <laughs> like... The Sixth Council, clear as day, makes its arguments on the basis of the energies proper to the human nature and the energies proper to the divine nature, 
that are both done by the one Christ. And I'm sorry, but that presupposes the essence energy distinction. How are you going to have energies in Christ if you don't believe in the essence energies? I mean, this is like, it's not even that difficult. It may say, if you're new to this, it might sound like, well, that's a, but if you, as a Roman Catholic, accept Peter Lombard's doctrine of identity thesis of the fourth Lateran council, then you can't believe the sixth council's teaching on the essence energy distinction. Those are mutually exclusive positions. How can you reduce person to nature as Lombard does, as Aquinas does, and not have the problems of modal collapse, not have the problems of created grace? Don't you see that their positions all flow from those presuppositions? Every time we have a Roman Catholic in here to debate this topic, the Thomas, they don't, they, they don't dispute that. They defend that. And it's in their mind, somehow they think that you can do Christology and Trinitarian stuff apart from natural theology. So I can, I can flesh out all this, uh, all these attributes of an absolute, absolutely simple essence. And then down the road, I can do Trinitarian and Christological stuff. Uh, it's wrong order of theology, dude. It starts with the Trinity. Does anybody else want to come on and speak? It's open forum. You can bring your argument. You can present your case. You can uh, put up whatever you want to put up. Go watch the Dr. Bradshaw Tomaszewski debate. And Dr. Bradshaw nails him when he says, doesn't it look like God does something different when he creates? Now, if Actus Purus is true, there's no God doing something different than he was doing before. And as Palamas argues against Barlaam, if God rests on the seventh day, then it's not the case that every act of God is synonymous with his essence. How could the seventh day, he's doing something different. So all we're saying in the essence of his doctrine is that God does different things. Actus Purus does not allow a God who does different things because if he does different things, it means he changes. And nobody believes God changes. But if you reduce God's actions to his essence, then any act that's different or new is a change. It's not rocket science, Roman Catholics. It's your own doctrine. It's your definition of God essentially identified with pure act. Matthew, what's up, Matthew? Hey, what's up, Matthew? Hey, uh, thanks for taking my question. Sure. Um, I was wondering just intuitively, uh, I hesitate to want to uh, limit uh, what saves people um, as as Christians um, because of the, uh, the man who's crucified with Christ and... Um, is saved and i don't know that that guy has like a, a a doctrine of salvation that's very complex yeah well i don't i don't deny that the grace of god can reach and save anybody so of course the thief on the cross is saved and uh he didn't but but there's also a uh, an opposite error which is that because uh Christ reaches down to the thief on the cross that therefore we should all remain in, um, you know, baby steps of Christianity. That's why Paul in the book of Hebrews right. rebukes people and says, you ought to be at the stage of meat. And here you are. He rebukes them for staying in a, a childlike, uh, situation in terms of their faith. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the lowest common, the lowest possible hanging fruit is, well, I'm just saying, so, so the fact, look, but so the, the fact that Christ saves the thief on the cross shows us that his mercy is, is there, sure. But that doesn't mean the thief on the cross is the goal that we should all be completely ignorant of our faith and not know anything. I mean, that's just, that's silly. Yeah. So, um, so okay. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of all these, uh, these doctrines that get fleshed out and, uh, you know, um, so I... Are there uh, things then that you would, you know, because I don't know that he has any kind of sense of, say, a, a doctrine of the Trinity where he makes an energy distinction or something like that. Um, 
So would you say that <coughs> things are necessary to believe to be saved or? Uh, well, everything God says is necessary to believe. So uh, we don't, you can't do this arbitrary thing where we just say, well, okay, well, uh, what's the lowest common denominator? Uh, uh, I only have to confess the name of Jesus. Okay, but, I mean, confess what Jesus, right? I mean, Mormon Jesus, okay. Jehovah's Witness Jesus. I mean, what? who is the Jesus that we're talking about here? Right. And in the case of the thief on the cross, uh, no, he actually, he does identify the deity of Christ. So yeah. his recognition okay, of the sense. Messiah is a recognition yeah. of the deity of Christ. Now, he might not have a, uh, you know, full-on theological recognition of the Trinity, sure. But neither did Abraham, and yet Abraham still recognized Yahweh, his angel, and the spirit. So that's an implicit recognition of the Trinity. So, okay. uh, again, and we can't absolutize specific examples like that, right? Like if you read the book of Acts, there are situations where due to the time and the place, um, Paul thought it was necessary to circumcise Timothy, for example. Well, should we always, so, so then should we all be circumcised because Paul circumcised besides Timothy? No. Should everybody strive to be ignorant like the thief on the cross because Christ saved him? No. Those are case examples that show us that in some cases it's necessary to do those things or that Christ can save people who have, uh, you know, we baptize infants. We don't think infants have a knowledge of the Trinity. They don't, they don't go into theological disputes, but that doesn't, but that's not the norm for every, not everybody's an infant, right? And so you have people like St. Athanasius who are having to combat uh, people who are destroying the gospel through Arianism. You have uh, Cyril, who's having to combat Nestorius, who's destroying the gospel through Nestorianism. So both of these things are the case. It's not an either or. Okay. Uh, that was a very good answer. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good question, actually. Um, let's see who's next. I can't read that. Roham? The writers of Roham. What's up, Roham? Rohirrim. Yo, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, good. Um, I wanted to ask you a bunch of stuff. So one of, one of the questions that I had, like, um, was, you know, that verse in uh, John chapter, I think it's John chapter 6, verse 37 says, All that the Father giveth gives to me shall come to me, and no one, and I will cast off no one so how does this like you know not prove the calvinist doctrine that you can't lose your salvation because he also says he will draw all men to himself oh, okay yeah i guess i guess and also I have another question so how do you um uh do you have like a good uh book recommendation on universalism well i'm against universalism so i mean if you read know, uh, like touching upon the topic why it's bad and stuff like well, it's heresy. Well, so it's heresy because it's condemned in seven councils in terms of the teaching of origin, and uh, the Confession of St. Sophronius condemns it explicitly. Uh, so you could get that book. Um, you could get St. Maximus, Saint Maximus's Ambigua because a large portion of the Ambigua are about refuting uh, originism. Refuting what? Originism. Oh, okay. Um, also, regarding the New Testament, so you have, uh -huh. like... Um, you know verses that are like added later on and then you have and then you have modern translations like ESV and other uh, biblical translations that take them out so how would you, how do you like um uh, like how do you reconcile that with the doctrine of inspiration and an errancy where like stuff from the bible just gets taken out what do you find out that you know it's not the earliest and then you know some bibles still keep that from Right. So inerrancy doesn't mean what Protestants and King James only people think it means. So the Orthodox uh, typically have used for the Old Testament, the Septuagint and for the New Testament, the received text. So uh, I have an interview with a guy named James Snap, S-N-A-P-P. -P, uh, and we go into about two hours of that topic. So if you want to look up the interview that I did with James Snap, it's really good. Oh, okay, all right. Because that's what I was just like wondering for you know, because you have like verses like in the, in the letters of John that says that right. there are three that would bear witness. Right. Like, would that be considered scripture or that? Yeah, it's called the Johannine comma, and uh, yeah, there's there's a case to be made that it's a, a later addition and it's not in uh, a lot of, of manuscripts. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a problem with uh, copyist errors with uh, medieval monks translating texts, and and because we can compare various manuscript traditions, right? So we're not relying upon uh, as if nobody has access to ancient texts. We only have, we, we just have to trust medieval monks or we just have to trust modern scholars. I mean, the, the position of the Orthodox Church is that we listen to the church, not academics, 
uh, not medieval Roman Catholic monks. We listen to the tradition of the received text that has been passed down in the various, uh, various bishoprics. So it's a different approach that we have. But we also don't have the idea of, like Muslims that there's like, or the King James only is that there is one specific perfect text. We don't think that. Um, and I don't think uh, textual tradition or scholarship leads us to think that. We, we don't have an, an autographa. Nobody does. And a part of the, in my, this is my opinion, part of the reason I think Christ didn't give us one perfect text is because the pillar and ground of truth, according to St. Paul, is the church, not the text. The church is the preserver of the text. The Bible is a liturgical document. It is not an academic document for a bunch of professors to, to decide what's true and false. Right, got it. Uh, another question: How is how do you understand the incarnation like in terms of being logical? Like you know, like like say God who is like you know, Jesus who is um, uncreated, um, you know, existing from all eternity, perfect, and then takes on like human limitations. How is that like uh, compatible? How does that go together? Like for example, well, this is the the idea that number one, um, we don't have dialectical presuppositions, right? So a lot of uh, theologies and Greek philosophies will set things in opposition. So, for example, in Greek thinkers, they would uh, define the one, the monad, the eternal, in opposition to the things in this world. So the monad is timeless, unchanging, unmoving. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's the opposite of the world which we have it inhabit which is temporal uh, undergoes flux and change uh, uh et cetera, et cetera. It has a beginning um we don't think that those things are uh defined in opposition they're not opposites right they are uh, yes that's the same guy truth seeker in, in the chat so how do we define them well the doctrine of creation uh gives us in our view if you watch the stream i did last night with seraphim hamilton we talk about how the doctrine of creation and the, the, uh, the idea of a personal God creating the world gives us a presupposition of incarnation. The, in other words, the world is not God's opposite. The world comes from the divine mind and is a reflection of the divine mind. And the divine mind is expressed preeminently in the person of the Logos. And so the person of the Logos is the presupposition of the created order in our view. And so not, therefore, it is not an, uh, an opposite to him. It is, can you, can you stop hammering for a second? Sorry, sorry. It's okay. Uh, he is therefore, uh, he created the world to enter the world. And when we look at the Old Testament, we see so many examples of theophanies. We see so, so many examples of God appearing in time and space, uh, the angel of the Lord, etc., that we don't see that there would be any problem if he can appear in time and space. If he can create the world, he can enter into the world. And so Trinitarian theology doesn't just say, for example, that it's a divine essence that became incarnate. It's the second person of the Godhead that became incarnate. The second person, the Logos, entered into time and space, entered into a mode of being that the other two persons in the Trinity did not. So the Father didn't become incarnate. The divine essence didn't become incarnate. The Spirit didn't become incarnate. The divine person of the Word became incarnate. So that's the theology of mode. Mode is very important in metaphysics and philosophy, which helps us understand Trinitarian theology and Christology. So when we come to Christology and we say that Who's incarnate? It's not, it's not the common essence. It's the second person, the second hypostasis, the Godhead that became incarnate. He has the divine essence, but it's not primarily the divine essence that became incarnate. It's the divine person of the word that became incarnate, entered into a mode of being, created our mode of being. So he has two natures, the divine nature and the human nature. And as a divine person, he utilizes that human nature, which is fully human, but he's not a human person. That's how we reconcile the fact that Christ became incarnate. And uh, if you read John chapter 1, he says that even as he walked and we, and we beheld him, he was in the bosom of the Father. So he never ceased being divine. He never ceased being in the bosom of the Father, eternally begotten, as he was walking around on earth. So was he, was he omnipresent? Yes. But he was in a special mode of being present in his human nature that he assumed, walking around over there in Jerusalem, you see. Right, right, I see. I understand that a bit better. Do you know um, any good books on the metaphysics of the Trinity? Yeah, I mean, basically every Orthodox theologian that we recommend will cover it, but I would say uh, the best would be uh, chapter, I mean, read uh, Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church by Vladimir Lossky, and particularly the Trinity chapter. Um, okay. read, read Theology in the Church by Father Staniloy, Dmitri Staniloy. 
read Experience of God by Father Demetrius Daniloy. Those are the best. Oh, okay. What about the one, uh, there's an Orthodox guy, I think it's called Bro Spronsky, where he wrote the book, um, The Mystery of the Trinity. Is that a good book? Uh, I know Lossky cites him, but I've not read him, so I can't oh. I can't say if uh, Bob Brinskoy is uh, solid or not. I, I really don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, I just had one more like request. I know like sure. you've done in the past, um, like you've done debate reviews like of other people, like you know Billy Lynn Craig, but like other right. atheists, and, and like you know Sam Harris, etc. So I just had a one more request. If you could just do um, debate reviews of like. Uh, Muslim, Muslims and the Protestants because most of the people who engage in like you know debates with uh, Muslim apologists are the Protestants on the subject of the Trinity so I was just like you know wondering if you could do well yeah but I've already or... done four debates with Muslims on the Trinity so just go oh, okay. okay I'll just go listen to that yeah so we okay. debated uh, Nazam Ghaffour Paul Williams uh, Shabir Ali and Azra Rashid so oh god because there the... are some um Muslims, like for example, I think Muhammad Hijab, right, and other uh, other Muslims like Adnan Rashid, who have made like I think good arguments. So I was just wondering if you could cover that as well. But well, I mean, they all kind of recycle and do the same stuff. So like, I think if you watch the uh, four debates I did, you will find most of those t- 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 points addressed. All right, all right, thank you. That was that was it. I appreciate yeah, it. Good questions. Uh, I'm, and yeah, maybe down the road I'll look at um, replying to some of those other guys. Uh, let's see. I want to remind you guys too. Uh, we got a nice, uh, uh over 300 today. We got a close to about 400, but I remember guys that the show sponsor is chalk.com. That is the best, uh, organic supplements out there. Um, I love chalk.com because our diets are nutrient deficient, right? So in our day, unfortunately we do have to supplement we, to get the nutrients that we need. Um, so for example, if you're looking to boost testosterone, the Tonkat Ali, the Tonkat 100 is proven in peer reviewed studies to boost testosterone. So I highly recommend that if that's what you're looking to do, if you're looking for mental clarity and focus, Jamie is a huge fan of the she legit. She takes it every day. Um, and if you've been watching her podcast with, uh, Rachel, uh, Bay's homeschool mom, you can tell that Jamie's been doing her homework, right? She's been reading lots of books. She read a giant 400 page, uh, Marxism book. And I said, how'd you do that? She said, because uh i've been taking my she legit there's also the daily which is great for just overall supplementation um and there's the ashwagandha there's the irish moss irish moss is good for hormone balancing um these are all uh better than organic actually they're rainforest sourced and it's a great way to support me by supporting them so if you go and use the promo code j50 you get 50 percent off everything in the store everything that you see on their awesome website 50 percent off you can't beat that deal Go ahead and lock that in now because there's legislation to try to shut down the buying of supplements online. Um, they're a red pill based company. They've been supporting me. They support Tristan. They support a lot of really solid people online and we love chalk.com. So uh, they also have the option of uh, recurring subscriptions. So you have to keep putting this information in. You can just set up uh, using the promo code J53 life, J53 life, and you get the supplements that you want delivered every month. So it's a little better option if you want to go that route. So remember, chalk.com, that's C-H-O-Q.com. Promo code is J50, J50, that gives you 50% off. Or J53LIFE, which is that recurring subscription. Uh, Ring, that Ring Girl is up. What's up, Ring Girl? Lord of the Rings? What's going on? My precious, you got the one ring? Hit unmute. Hello? What's up? I thought you were a girl. It's a ring girl. Yeah, I've just got one question. Uh, All right. One. The dude's in a bathtub trying to do what I do. All right. Only I'm allowed to be on a live stream or on an audio chat in a bathtub. Nobody else can be in a bathtub. We don't tolerate that around here. Dude's over there dripping in the bathtub. Blip, 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 blip. No bathtubs allowed, boy. Get out of here with your bathtub live stream talk. You know, I'm the one that pioneered that. Literally, years of hours of bathtub live stream. Anybody else have any questions, any arguments, any disputes, any debates? You want to put me in my place? You want to put me down? You can do it. My feelings won't be hurt. 
I think I've, uh, I think I finally achieved tough skin. The internet, uh, has been mean to me for many years and I, that's okay. I accept the mean in the internet. My feelings aren't hurt. Matthew, what's up, Matthew? How you doing? By the way, uh, issuing formal, uh, challenge, as I mentioned, uh, Matt Frad, what's up, dude? Hey, uh, open challenge to debate any topic you want to debate on orthodoxy rum catholicism you can you can host it you can put your boys in charge i don't care dude any time any place you name it formal debate we all know matt fry won't do it and we all know that his excuse will be that i'm just too mean really really okay okay matt but i want everybody to know that you won't accept the debate so that's why that's why we're doing this we know matt won't accept it now trent Plenty of other people in your circles are happy to step up to the plate, but why won't Matt? Now, Matt says, Matt claims he's got philosophy degrees. I mean, why won't you debate Matt if you've got the philosophy degree? So, you, so you've got the goods. Uh, what, what? Why won't you step up in the debate? Now, he said, of course, that in a condescending way, Jay Dye will never be on my channel. Okay. But why won't you debate? I mean... Are your feelings so soft that I, I'm so mean that I hurt your feelings? Well, what, why not just like come on a debate and just demolish my arguments? And everybody can see that it's a smokescreen. The years of calling me mean is really just an excuse to not do a formal debate. Now, Trent, I'm sure thinks I'm mean, but Trent did a debate. And um, hopefully, I'm hoping that Trent will set up another discussion, right? We, I, I reached out to Trent today because he reached out to me about setting up a presup discussion, a presuppositional argument, transcendental argument roundtable. He wanted to get uh, some Protestant, uh, Jeremiah Bannister and me, uh, to go on and do a, that. So, okay, yeah, let's do it. Um, but I don't know if Bannister will be willing to do that. I don't think he is. I mean nothing against Bannister. I've known Jeremiah Bannister for a long time. Um, I think he's a, a nice guy. Always been um, on good terms with Bannister. So I hope he would like to do that discussion. And look, if, if people think that I'm too mean, all you have to do is set it up in a formal way, right? Because a formal debate doesn't allow me to, uh, what, what is it? What am I going to do? Interrupt, make a joke that hurts feelings. I mean, what's, what is the mean going to actually do in a debate? Right. And by the way, if I'm totally, if I'm just a totally a butthole, like, wouldn't that come through in the debate? Like, wouldn't it be obvious that I'm just too mean and I can't actually win the debate and I'm having to rely on being mean? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you just want to uh, at least just demonstrate this, right? But I don't, we all know that he's not going to do a debate, but I want it to be known that, uh, you know, just as uh, Seraphim Hamilton offered the, the debate to uh, Hamza and uh, by extension, I think any of the other Muslims that want to, um, you know, step up to the plate. Yeah, I mean, I've got an outstanding debate offer for uh, Matt Frad, uh, and then if Trent wants to organize the the Transcendental Argument debate roundtable with me, Bannister, and a Protestant, I'd love to do it. Uh, but you know, I don't I don't understand what what are, what are these people so worried about? Like, why? What what's the? If it's a formal debate, I can't be mean to you. I mean, I guess I could, but like, how am I going to do that? Am I going to hack in your computer and mute you? <laughs> I mean, if, if I was in a, uh, if I was, I mean, when I came, when I debated Trent, didn't we debate on a Roman Catholic channel? Right. We would debate it over on Suan's channel. So I stepped out of my sphere. When I debated with Erica Barra, where did, where did we do that debate? Oh, we did that over on Lofton's channel, didn't we? So we have been willing to step into the, for the 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 uh, away game court, right? We go we go into your court. Uh, the the priest that debated Ibarra, he went on uh, what Frad's channel or whatever. But w no Roman Catholics will step over into our corner and debate. No Roman Catholics will publicly have a debate with me who aren't like people with one thousand followers and crazy. Except for Trent. So I, I, I respect Trent. I think Trent is a, uh, a respectable guy. He will step up to the plate. Um, he, he never bitched about me being mean, rude, whatever. Well, he did a little bit at first, but then he did the debate and 
didn't seem to have a problem with the I mean, in the debate on Suan's channel, did, did anybody get mean? Did anybody get their feelings hurt? Did any Roman Catholics go home crying? Their feelings are hurt. The Templars, the Knights, the Crusaders get their feelings hurt. Did you want to say something, Matt? And by the way, the Muslims too, like, after four debates, public debates with Muslims, they're still saying, I'm scared of debating Muslims. Like, how many times do your people have to get debated before you fall on the the whole thing of that I'm scared? And so, oh, you didn't debate Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, because Jake's a joke, dude, and he got shown to be a joke. As I said all along, he, that, dude was a, that dude was ridiculous. He would never say what his school was. He flip-flops and changes his schools, and all the other Muslims called him out on that. So Jake is a joke. Dr. Branson made him look ridiculous. And that's exactly what I said the whole time of why I wouldn't debate Jake. And Jake said, you better give me special treatment. Uh, I want a cross-examination where you don't get to talk, and I get to, you get to shut up, and I get to... That's not how cross-examination works. And by the way, they still don't seem to understand this. They're like the worst. Just totally, for, debate is just foreign to them, right? It's like, they don't, they, they can't get it, right? So you get to cross-examine me, but I get to cross-examine you. That's a classical debate thing. And the Muslims can't get this, right? You can read under the debate where, the debates where we do that. He won't, uh, he interrupt. Why he interrupt? Why he interrupt? Because it's cross-examination, dude. And the other person can interrupt me. Good grief. I guess Matthew left. He didn't have anything to say. So, again, Muslims, atheists, they have no fear in stepping up to the plate to do debates. Do any of them complain about me being mean? No. The only people who complain that I'm mean are the bold crusaders, the Roman Catholics. Interesting. Crusaders. Matthew, what's up, dude? Hey, Jay. What's up? Thanks for taking another question of mine. Sure. Um, I don't think you're mean, by the way. Uh, I don't care. It's okay. You can think I'm mean. It doesn't bother me. Well. I mean, I've already said that I'm a satanic. I'm a satanic drug lord. I think I think being a satanic drug lord includes being mean. So how's that? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be a very good satanic drug lord if I was not mean, if I was nice. So, yeah, I got to be mean. True. Question: um, My my parents are uh, Wycliffe Bible translators, and so I grew up in uh, in Africa in that world. And uh, I was wondering if the the Orthodox Church had a uh, a kind of a. I know that the, the the Catholic Church had issues with all the translation translations of the Bible being done into English and stuff. I was wondering if the Bible was widely available and translated in the Orthodox world. I mean, it's always been the position of the Orthodox Church that the uh, scriptures are in the vernacular. Uh, so I would say, Very yeah. Cool. I mean, the, the liturgy is always in the vernacular. Okay. Very cool. Now I, I couldn't tell you though, the history of all the different Orthodox countries and translations. I don't, I don't know that history. All right. Yeah, good questions. Um, yeah, oh, by the way, so people in the chat, uh, yeah, I forgot about Cosmic Skeptic. I mean, we asked that dude uh, on Twitter. Long, all the people that everybody says you need to debate, we've asked them many times, okay? So EMJ has been asked multiple times. Uh, Cosmic Skeptic has been asked. Um, uh, who else? Who are the... Muhammad Hijab was asked. He ignored it. Uh, he ignored it. it. Had like 500 likes and thumbs up and or retweets. I should say likes and retweets, and he ignored it. Um, he, he could Kikachu, whatever his name is, ignored it. Um, all those people ignore the 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 requests or the the offers. So I don't. Uh, people need to get with the program. Like all these people, we've already been doing this for for a long time now, right? I mean, I asked Ibarra for years to come on and do a debate. And he would never do it. And then said, I wouldn't debate him. 
And so I went on their stream. You notice I we go on their stuff and they're terrified to come because they say that if they come in our domain, they're going to get cheated. They're going to get edited and all this. Come on, dude. Nobody's going to edit you if it's a live stream, dummy. Can't edit you. You're going to get muted. You're going to mute me. I mean, Su Suan Sona, I wasn't afraid of Suan muting me in the debate with Trent. All you got to do is have a formal debate. If it's formal, then you can't do trickery. Uh, by the way, inspiring philosophy. He backed out of the debate because I was too mean, right? Who else backs? They all back out, dude. They're all such cowards, dude. These people are soy men cowards. That's why. That's what it is. Uh, they're passive aggressive theology nerds who just can't handle it. And so I come from a different domain, right? I come from the world of philosophy. And if you're in the world of philosophy, even in today's, you know, cucky universities, you still get the importance of debate. You get the importance of having your ideas challenged, challenging other people's ideas. I mean, we, we were doing debates with professors in as sophomores. And so when I come into out of the world of philosophy and come into the domain of YouTube uh, uh, apologetics and they're all such soy males, so afraid of a debate. And they all just want to just present how pious they are. And they're just so pious. And uh, I hope y'all will just pray with me. And we just need to love each other. And we're not polemical. You are polemical. It's a, it's a facade, dude. What are you talking about? You're not polemical? Of course you are. Right? Ibarra, Lofton, saying they're not polemical. Everybody knows your whole thing is to stop people from converting to orthodoxy. That's all you talk about. All they've talked about for like, what, four years now is don't go Orthodox. By the way, please come to our Uni 8 parishes. <laughs> I, can't, I mean, these people are ridiculous, right? They're ridiculous, dude. Uh, I don't see any more people. Does anybody want to come on and present any argument? Any You, could, you can have the floor for as long as you want. We give people the floor. Yeah, I'm going to make jokes. So if you get your feelings hurt, don't come on. If you're a soft person who gets their feelings hurt easily from me doing an impression or making a joke, then this is not for you. Praetor. What's up, dude? Praetor. Praetor. Yeah, the uh, the audio on Twitter has been cutting in and out, so I'm kind of oh dual wielding here on PC and using my phone to ask the questions. Oh, so okay. Sorry about that. If the audio doesn't work, uh... yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on with Twitter. I mean, it, I don't know. Uh, go ahead. All right. So my question uh, has to do with the logos, okay. and I'm wondering if there's any differentiation between the Latin and the Orthodox. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, if there's any uh, difference between the Orthodox and Latin understanding of the logos, and if one or the other <clears throat> applies more, um, I guess, an agreement with, with Philo's uh, description of the logos as the intermediary. Yeah. And then I'll just, that's, that's my question. I'll just listen to your answer. So uh, I would say between the Orthodox Church and the Latin Church, the tendencies do differ. And what we'll find is that in the attempts to prove and stress their conception of natural theology, they will oftentimes do a word equivalence fallacy whereby they plumb Greek philosophy, find the word logos, and then say, aha, see, we're all talking about the same deity. So John in the book of John and John one is uh, talking about the same thing as Marcus Aurelius when he talks about logos. Um, that's not true. That's a word concept fallacy. The fact that the same word is used really does not tell us whether uh, the meaning is the same. So it's a question of meaning, but we find this a lot in uh, the, the Roman Catholic natural theology apologetic where they do a bait and switch and they say, aha, see, see, this is what we're talking about. When it's completely different uh, things. I mean, Aristotle's first mover is not the same thing as when St. Maximus or St. John Damascus uses the term uh, first cause or first mover. 
Just because it's the same word doesn't mean it's the same thing. And Aristotle is not teaching what we teach. Aristotle thinks that there's a soul unmoved mover that is impersonal, that is pure thought, that moves an eternal world that is opposite himself. That's not the Christian view. So even though there might be similarities in terms and there might be some overlap, the idea that these are all equivalent is false. And there's a great paper by an academic, uh, Dr. Gareby, G-E-R-E-B-Y, called Theistic Fallacies that shows this from a logical perspective. Now, in terms of Philo, it is true that Philo did uh, discuss a kind of binary idea of a, of a uh, second power or second principle in terms of the Godhead, and he did think of it as a kind of mediating principle. But I don't think that that originates with Philo. I actually think the Hebrew texts themselves posit uh, a multiplicity in God, a multiple uh, notion even older than Philo. So we see this, for example, in Genesis when we have Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, and his spirit. So we see that as early references to what the Orthodox Church believes is the Trinity. Okay, so what, in your opinion, then, was understood by the writer of John with John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the yeah. Logos, right? So... So it's translated as word, but right. is that is that quite different from, say, Philo's understanding of that? Yeah, divine, because it's the um, it's the second person of the Godhead who is the personal Son, the Logos, and that's not what Philo thought it was. Okay, my understanding of it's, of it's Jesus. Was it's Jesus. It's almost the lens through which creation. Okay. Was made. Okay, and Paul says that the the world was made through the logos, but it the the point is that the New Testament is more specific in specifying that Jesus is the logos. Right, right. That's that's my understanding as well. Um, I guess my question is, um, what was the writer of John intending by using that word? So I think that he was. Uh, pulling from the wisdom texts of the Old Testament, pulling from particularly texts in Proverbs, uh, Syriac, um, Wisdom of Solomon, where you have uh, Hebrew usages of the wisdom of God, the word of God, the voice of God. Um, you have, for example, in the Septuagint, in um, the books of Kings, you have the voice that appears to, uh, to Elijah. The voice is the word. And so even Holy of Holies, if you listen to the live stream that we did last night with Seraphim Hamilton, he was talking about how sometimes Holy of Holies is translated as the word as well. So I think that the point is that <clears throat> John is picking out the, the, the word in Genesis 1 and playing on Genesis 1 uh, as a kind of recreation narrative in John 1 that the Logos is who the world was created by, for, and through. And that is Jesus. So is there a relation there? to the noose like a divine noose almost no i think that's more of a platonic idea i don't i don't think that um i mean noose is sometimes used as mind and so yeah some church fathers do speak of christ as the mind of the father or the mind of god but in our theology that would be known as uh, an energetic manifestation so christ isn't literally the mind of god but he does express the mind of god and particularly in relation to the created order Hey, do you have anything I could read specifically on this topic? Because I find this fascinating and I'm just learning. I don't know. So I'm asking with, a, with an open mind here and a blank slate of how I would research this because I find. Yeah, I think uh, if you read, if you read, if you read Dr. Bradshaw's book, Aristotle East and West, he will go into in what way the Orthodox Church did uh, see insights in uh, Philo in terms of the second power uh, uh, being logos. If you look at, um, tr for more specific Trinitarian theology, I would say you could read Lossky's book, mystical theology, of the Eastern church. Um, but there's other books too, which get into like, um, the body of God in ancient Israel and how e other, other scholars beyond that point out that, uh, let me, let me see. Hold on. I got it right here. So there's uh, Alan Siegel's book, Two Powers in Heaven, covers it from a, uh, a Jewish textual perspective. And then Benjamin Somer's book, Body of God, An Ancient World of Israel, covers it again from 
a Jewish textual perspective where they're pointing out that even in the even in the Hebraic text prior to um, to Philo, you have this notion of more than just a Unitarian deity, and they're making the argument that that would have influenced Philo. But Philo's influence for the Orthodox Church actually is more so in regard to the essence energy distinction and not so much the distinction in the persons. Okay, so that's way over my head at this point, but I'll, I'll take all your suggestions. So I would start with, yeah, start I, was, I, would start, I would start so with, I would start with uh, Dr. David Bradshaw's book, Aristotle East and West, and you'll see in that chapter where he covers Philo what I'm talking about there. Perfect. Thank you for sure. the uh, answer. Yeah, good questions. Uh, okay, I don't see any more requests. So uh, here, now that there's 330 people uh, more than there was uh, earlier, now there's no more requests. <laughs> um, anybody else want to come on? I mean, we shared the Twitter space. Uh, I got a little bit more energy. Uh, we'll go to if we don't see anybody else come in, I'll go ahead and do super chats. Um, I remind you guys too that uh, the live the next live show is in Orlando. So if you want to uh, come to our event September 3rd in Orlando, here is the link. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, we will be doing a discussion uh, on my new book, which covers uh, some philosophical topics and essays, meta narratives, essays in philosophy and symbology. Uh, we had a great event in Nashville. We had 120 people live or more than 120 people actually, because some people uh, I invited who, uh, to come and no ticket. So we probably had, I don't know, 125 maybe. Uh, and that event was um, cool. We had, uh, you know, book signing. We had uh, about 30 minutes or so of comedy and my cringe comedy seemed to go over well. It seemed to be uh, enjoyable. We had about uh, 40 people who showed up by channeling. I channeled them with my esoteric occult satanic drug lord powers uh, and they spoke through me. Uh, aka impressions so we had about 40 of those or so and uh, the crowd seemed to have fun with that and uh all of those uh, voices and perhaps more will make an appearance september 3rd in orlando at the tap room you'll see if you go to the eventbrite link that you can get tickets there uh there's limited tickets so uh we sold mm, approaching a half uh, of the hundred tickets and so you got about three more weeks so if you want to go ahead and secure that ticket i would say go ahead and do it we are looking uh, at doing an Austin event and a Hollywood event. So, you know, assuming everything goes well, uh, we'll be make, making our way out west coast to the West Coast. Uh, we, obviously, we got to do Austin, but um, yeah. So I do goofy stuff for 30 minutes, an hour, break the ice. Then we have uh, Jamie. Jamie will do a presentation where she's covering AI occult Hollywood. So Jamie's taking up the Hollywood mantle this time. Uh, it's a little bit more this year because th at this event because uh, Father Vladimir, who you guys have all seen in my Renaissance uh, like, uh, course that we interview that we did, where he did basically a course. Uh, Father Vladimir will do it, be doing his presentation, um, so it's a little bit more because we want to pay him. And then I will be doing uh, an hour and a half on the Meta Narratives book, covering the Logi, covering uh, philosophical issues, Leibniz, etc., for an hour and a half, and then we'll do book signing and Q and A. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a, an, an evening with me and these these guests, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. So you get six hours of cringe philosophical content. Uh, what's up, Conrad? Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, man? Well, you answered my first question, which was when you come to Austin. That was what I was going to ask first. Uh, well, I don't know the date, so like, uh, when the, we did the Nashville event, I guess we waited about a month to set up the uh, Orlando event. So it, it seems like it takes about four to six weeks to set up the next event because people need time to plan for it. And then um, reserving venues is a lot harder than I thought. So it's actually quite a bit of a challenge to reserve venues. So um, I would say after September 3rd, uh, looks like we'll probably be going to have a DC event. I'm going to, uh, and then we have a England event that we're going to, um, we might be able to organize the England, the, the England Oxford event as a speaking event. Not sure yet, but maybe we're going to try to do that. That'll be, I think October. So probably, um, Austin would be more like November. Sounds good, man. I'll be, I'll 
definitely sure to try to make it and bring a lot of people here to be. Yeah, well, it was cool to meet you. You know, yeah, we, we met in Austin, uh, you know, back when you were first looking at Orthodoxy uh, at that event. So I, I remember meeting up at the uh, draft house, Alamo draft house. Yeah, man, things have, you know, the, the seeds have spread. You yeah. Know, the pe- community's growing. We got all sorts, both the parish, a lot of the parishes here are way bigger, which is. Oh, awesome. Good. But, yeah, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun at that movie well. premiere. Yeah. I'm, I'm planning on ordering it. You still recommend people read God, History, and Dialectic, right? Yeah, I don't agree with uh, all of Dr. Farrell's other views, but uh, God History Dialectic is, uh, is is a good work, yeah. Yeah, I'm probably going to get part one. I hear that's where, you know, the meat of the important stuff is. I'm mm-hmm. probably going to order that here pretty soon. Just yeah, I, to, I still think that's... your thoughts on that. It's yeah, I still think all of that is, is sol- a, solid argumentation, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to Austin, man. Just okay. uh, I'll, be, I'll be keeping my ear to the ground there. So hope to see you soon. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Conrad. Zach Galway, what's up, dude? How you doing? Right. Hello? Hey, how you doing? Uh, okay. It might cut out a minute here because I can never really hear anyone on this. It's, I don't know, my Wi-Fi is just bad, so can you hear me at all? Or... I can. You can? Right, okay. Um, I, got a, I got a text from a friend at church saying that it's possible I could become a catechumen either tomorrow or on Sunday. And I want to know if you have any advice for anyone who's about to become a catechumen. Uh, my only advice would be if you go watch the stream that I did a, a few years ago with David, where it's uh, uh, traps for the or- for new Orthodox people. So you're you're gonna um, enter into the arena. You're gonna be uh, tempted with a lot of different things for a catechumen. You're gonna be tempted to go off into weird theological things. You're gonna be tempted with. Um, Romanides obsession with universalism with hyper rigorism all of these kinds of things are going to be temptations for anybody coming into orthodoxy so I would just say beware of those things and um, don't rush into anything take your time any of the theological issues that come up and they will come up um, don't get upset if, you, if your questions uh, I'm not talking about me but questions in general where we all have questions we all have doubts we all have concerns if they're not immediately answered uh, just be patient chill out and take your time. That's my, my only piece of advice. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good question, Zach. Thank you. Um, Gug. What's up, Gug? How you doing, man? Hey there, Jay. Hey. Hey, appreciate it. Um, I appreciate all your work. I just had a question about, I guess, Judas, Iscariot, when I read about it, when Christ says that, you know, it's better for him to not have been born, I kind of wrestle with that, right? Like, if he wasn't born, would someone else have kind of done the same thing? Well, I mean, obviously we know in divine providence that it he, he was going to be born. So, I mean, yeah, I, I just think it's an expression of the mystery of, you know, human will and theodicy. So... You know, Job speaks that way too. Like, right, like when when Job is in the midst of his worst struggle, he's like, you know, it would have been better if I'd never been born. But you know, those things aren't aren't uh, really up for us to decide. But um, I, I don't think we will ever have any in this life full explanation or answer to, you know, the difficulties of of the problem of theodicy. Okay. I mean, I I don't I, I wish I had a better answer, but I, I mean. I, I just don't think I think one thing about orthodoxy that I actually find appealing is that um, it's OK with saying that in this life, we don't get all the answers and things are mystery. It doesn't mean everything's mystery. It doesn't mean that, oh, well, that means you can contradict everything. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that actually, if you think about it, there's no worldview that can meet the criterion of explaining theodicy perfectly. So whether you're an atheist or whether you're a Muslim, there's no worldview that can actually give like a full on perfect answer to um, how the mechanics of free will and divine sovereignty work together. No position can do that because because we're finite human beings. So. Right. So I appreciate that. I I was just really I'm not trying to do a gotcha. I'm sure a lot of people are. Um, No, it's okay. I mean, there are I mean, look, there's there's. Everybody has doubts. Everybody has struggles. Everybody will encounter theological problems, philosophical problems that it's difficult to explain or reconcile. And I think part of the point of Job is that 
our finitude limits us from being able to really get full on explanations for all those problems. But the reason I think Christianity is still true and it, and, and doesn't fall prey to, uh, the theodicy dilemma is in Christianity, we at least have a basis to believe in good and evil. We have a basis to believe in why it's wrong and why it's right to do X, Y, Z. But if Christianity isn't true, not only do we lose a basis for ethics, the other positions don't actually don't do anything any better. It's not like, oh, well, if, uh, if I go to uh, being an atheist, I won't have the problem of theodicy. Well, actually, atheism and materialistic positions still have the same philosophical dilemmas, except they're even worse. So in other words, the, the challenges to solve them become even more difficult, more impossible. Does that make sense? So I think it's you're on even worse ground in the other positions. Like it's not like you get a one up and the other positions don't have the same dilemmas that they have to try to solve or answer, so to speak. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I was listening to the debate you did, I think maybe two days ago where you had someone come in and they were like, you know, I think God's a scam and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And you were, and you were just asking like, okay, like, do you believe murder is right or wrong? Yeah. Like, obviously she didn't really flesh that out. Like she kind of just did, but mm-hmm. is that the best they could like, is that the furthest you've ever even heard? Like, I feel like they can't even go farther than what, what that is. They just go, Oh, well murder is wrong. Cause it is. And you're like, is that the best? Well, I mean, th- that was that woman was an unsophisticated, uh, oh, just kind okay. of like Reddit level atheist, and so certainly with atheist philosophers or professors, you're you're going to get something a little more sophisticated or fleshed out. But I don't think that they actually have any substance to giving a real answer or a real basis for ethics. So they might have fancier words and they might have a little better presentation. But uh, I mean. I think atheism is a box that's very limiting. And when you, from the outset, have the atheist presuppositions, you really, there's not much wiggle room. You really can't, you're going to be forced into some kind of subjectivism, some kind of relativism, some kind of moral nihilism, where uh, ethics are, are really, right and wrong are really just taste preferences. And, you know, there's a lot of people who try to make uh, ethical uh, arguments. I mean, even Matt Dillahunty tries to do this, where he talks about like, why don't we all just uh, accept uh, secular humanist ethics and, and uh, the, you know, the good of human nature in general and, and that we, we should all, but it's like, you're missing the point, right? Like what is the justification for why we ought to believe that? We know you think that we know uh, you have an account of humans as these sort of evolutionary products, but none of those things, those accounts don't give us any normativity. They don't tell us why we ought to believe that, why we should do this as opposed to that. And this gets back to that classic enlightenment problem of you can never derive an ought from an is. And the atheist worldview is all basically just listing what is the case. We just are brute matter. It just is brute facts. It just is, uh, you know, matter in motion. There's nothing else. That's all there is. Okay. But that can never tell us what ought to be the case. It's a category mistake. So no, uh, in my view, no atheist by the limitations and necessity of their own system can ever present an argument as to why we ought to do X, Y, Z and to have ethics requires ought. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Do you mind if I ask you one more? Sure. What's up? Um, I grew up like Roman. I went to a Roman Catholic school and then I moved to the South. Everyone's Protestant. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the biggest hurdle, I'm, I'm trying to find a church to go to, which I believe is ultimately going to be orthodox but the they have they're completely divorced from history it seems like like how, wait I'm wait who, who's who's divorced like who's that. divorced oh just a lot of protestants i run into. oh yeah well yeah <laughs> seem to just disregard yeah any of that sure. is there and without trying to be like you know i'm not trying to be rude or anything but i don't know how to actually get through to that i i know people that just throw up a church and say you know he's he speaks the word of god but do they, is there any argument for them as far as like jurisdiction and authority that they would even like submit to? I feel like they just shut their ears off to that. You, a Protestants in general? Uh, I guess not all of them, but just the ones I've ran into. Like a lot of Baptists, a lot of Methodists, Presbyterian. 
Uh, no, I think that um, no Protestant tradition can ever solve the question of authority. Um, and we don't mean the question of authority in a sense of uh, epistemology, but question of authority in the sense of what's called normativity, right? That there's any living group or body that has any real authority to make declarations. Because, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a Methodist and uh, the Methodist church, I don't even think they do this, but f for the sake of argument, if the Methodist excommunicated me, I could just go to the Baptist church down the street, right? So, I mean, that's, and that's the whole dilemma of Protestantism is that, you know, when I read the New Testament, Paul talks about excommunicating people. So if your church doesn't even have any conception of excommunicating people, then clearly it doesn't have authority or a conception of authority that's in the New Testament. And then when I look at the history of the church, clearly the Orthodox Church and all those ecumenical councils excommunicates people, calls them heretics and says, have no dealings with those groups. So, you know, there's some huge disjunct, which you're pointing out in your comments there. Um, and just familiarizing oneself with church history really compounds those questions. And so, you know, me being Protestant, I was confronted with those same questions, got into the church fathers, got into the history of the councils, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, you just have to either face up to it or you kind of do a little mental gymnastics and, and talking yourself into some other thing where you're like, well, uh, you know, uh, my, my Presbyterian church is true because they're the most uh, faithful to the Bible. Well, but I mean, every church says we're the most faithful to the Bible. And, uh, you know, if the, if the Presbyterian church uh, excommunicates you, you can go to the other Presbyterian church, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, really. Right. And why would, I guess, why would Jesus set up a church that we would have to wait 16, 1700 years, like, to get, exactly. you know, like, am I on the right track with that? Like, I feel like I'm on an island where I'm at. <laughs> You know? Well, yeah, that's why you need to, you know, go check out a good, uh, you know, Serbian church, Russian, Rokor church, uh, Romanian church, you know, I, any of those parishes, I would say would be where you'd, we would, you would want to go visit the liturgy, go check out the liturgy. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Very yeah, man. Much, man. Great questions. It. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do the super chats. So we got quite a few here to catch up on max power, $5. Thank you, bro. I just left the Roman Catholic church. Hopefully we'll be received into the Orthodox church soon. Awesome. Now you do really, you have that max power, max power. That's what I'm talking about. Good to hear it, man. Hungarian $5. What's the Orthodox view of free will? Uh, I would say that it's fundamental to uh, Christology as the paradigm that we have as a part of our human nature and uh, a will as a faculty that uh, is free to choose this or that, to choose vice, to choose virtue. So the doctrine of free will in our sin, I wouldn't, I would be, be hesitant with some of the modern categories of is it libertarian? Uh, is it compatibilism? I mean, we do believe that we have our own energy to choose or to act in this or that way. So we do believe in free will. But we also believe that it, it is not like it doesn't overcome God's uh, providence or sovereignty. Um, all human or created actions are under the purview of divine providence. And how exactly that works, we don't know all the mechanics of it, but we do think that divine revelation tells us that there are secondary causes, that God is a cause, but there are also created causes. And he has structured the universe such that there can be secondary created causes. Uh, and they don't overthrow him, and they yet work within his divine providence. Can it be logically argued that man has free will and that God uh, can prophesy things since we both know that both are true? Uh, so, yes, in that sense, I would say that we believe in a kind of compatibilism. Palantir, $3. Jay, thank you for what you do. Can you comment on the interplay of God's sovereignty and free will? Well, uh, see the previous comment to the Hungarian. Um, I know Orthodox hold that these things coexist in harmony but i struggle with this has god fixed the time of our death in his plans um yes i mean paul speaks of uh, in Acts 17 that divine providence has determined all the events of history not in a call not in a first cause sense but determined the sense of knowing what the cause what, what the causal chains will be so uh yes god knows and has decided when we will die um and yet uh, our choices are still free. So again, in Orthodox theology, there's the acceptance of both of those things being true. So even though we struggle with it, it doesn't, our struggles and our limitations in this life don't cancel out what scripture sees as something as a harmony. Does that make sense? And again, the paradigm model is the, is the incarnation. Christ's human nature has its will and its energy. 
that synergizes with the divine will and energy that he possesses as a divine person. So the hypostatic union is really the, the great paradigm for the reconciliation of divine sovereignty and human free will. Palantir, $3. If you ever have an opportunity to have a dialogue with Dr. Jordan Peterson, is this something that you would uh, be potentially fruitful and interested in? Uh, sure, I would always be willing to have that conversation. I mean, we've had, uh, you know, friendly uh, conversations and interactions with uh, Jonathan Pajot for many years. Uh, I like Jonathan. I think he's a good guy. Um, he does a lot of great work and a lot of great uh, uh, decoding and analysis of symbols uh, similar to what we do. Um, and I know, you know, we all know that uh, uh, Pajot and uh, Dr. Peterson are great friends. So I certainly hope uh, that, you know, Dr. Peterson uh, comes into orthodoxy and moves in our direction. He seems to have an interest in that way. Um, but, you know, I don't know that he would ever want to talk to me. So, you know, if, if he does, I'd be happy to do it. But um, I don't know. Uh, and it's not because I don't have any ill will against him. Um, you know, we've critiqued classical liberalism in the past. And so, you know, I don't know if he, he might see that as, uh, you know, annoying. He might not like the fact that we've uh, critiqued his uh, classical liberalism and that kind of stuff. But um, I would always be open to any conversation like that. Sure. Orthodox guy, one dollar. Have you heard of the Roman Catholic lay order, the neocatechumenal way? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, when I was a traditional Catholic, this was very sort of uh, controversial because they're big promoters of uh, charismaticism. And uh, one of the things that we, we trad cats always uh, harped about was the fact that, um, you know, Rome seemingly in many cases uh, gave this stupid stuff its blessing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't uh, Brother Roger Schutz, uh, that weird guy who was like the, the head of all that, I mean, I'm pretty sure uh, Benedict blessed that and either John Paul or Benedict gave him... Uh, communion so <laughs> um they teach that the true church was lost from constantine to vatican well i never heard that so uh i'm not doubting you but that's even more heterodox than i thought they were i thought they were like some kind of a, a quasi anglican thing let's see what brother roger schutz was now he it was weird because he's not actually like a roman catholic monastic uh, he was i thought he was like an episcopal is it brother roger of taize maybe i'm thinking of the the taize community which is a roman catholic uh oh it actually says he's classed as reformed reformed brother i've never heard of that how could you be reformed and be some kind of <laughs> okay so Excuse me. Uh, so Taize, I'm getting that mixed up with the neocatechumenal way. Although I thought neocatechumenal way is also blessed by the Roman Catholic Church as well, which is weird. Let's see. I'm pretty sure that's right. I haven't thought about um, any of this stuff since I was a trad cat in like 25 or 6 or 2005 or 6. So let's see. Neocatechumenal way. Look, I'm just looking this up because it's, it's been a long time since I thought about this. I, doesn't Father Seth from Rose bring up some of this in uh, Orthodox and the Religion of Future? Neocatechumenal Neo Way is an association of Christian faithful within the Catholic Church. Okay, so they are supposedly Catholic. Uh, they take their inspiration from early Catholic converts from paganism. Um... They are in accordance, supposedly, with Roman Catholic RCIA. So I, where are you getting this thing that they believe the church apostatized after Constantine? I, I haven't heard this. Now, the other weirdo, that Roger Schutz guy, is like a super charismatic uh, ecumenist dude. Yes, I'm correct. And he is the big friend of uh, Benedict. So here's uh, Roger Schutz who is not Catholic, but was given communion by, by super trad Benedict. And that weirdo, Roger Schutz, a reformed monk, brother Roger. I mean, so he's just like a mega ecumenist dude. Um, and then there, 
But no, look, all this stuff is garbage, dude. All this is just garbage. And by the way, this alone should tell you the Roman Catholic Church is false, that they, they have approved from the highest levels uh, this charismatic jibber-jabber. Uh, Nick, $10. I work as a therapist, and I introduce my clients to orthodoxy and orthodox concepts like the logismoi, which is things that come up like in the philokalia. I use secular language, and they find it helpful. How do I tell orthodox people who are bought into psychology. Oh, how to sell orthodoxy to people who are bought into psychology. Um, probably the most would be orthodox psychotherapy, right? Wouldn't that be the easiest overlap? That book by Herotius Vlacos. Uh, I think that would be the book you want. Um, well, Emmanuel, $5. I might need to actually read and understand this instead of feeling smart while watching. Uh, you mean the Bonjour book or the epistemology? But I wouldn't start with the Bonjour book. I would start with the epistemology by W.J. Wood because it's a little more readable. Sebastian Lopez, $10. Come back to Texas for one of the events. Uh, yeah, we're going to do one in Austin. So shout out to Sebastian. Uh, we had a great time uh, meeting Sebastian and going to church with him in Houston. Um, Father Julian's parish, uh, super awesome based, uh, priest there in uh, Houston, Father Julian. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, how close is Austin? What, like a couple few hours from, uh, like two or three from Houston. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be in Austin. Bone man, $10. Do you have any thoughts or thoughts on the child eternus? Puer Eternus. Uh, I don't know what that is. The Thieves on the Cross, the Spring Equinox, and the Autumn Equinox. Um, I don't know. I don't know about a connection between that. I haven't heard of that. What about Grace acknowledging that we ought to be like little children in Matthew 23 to enter the kingdom? Yeah, but that doesn't mean that Jesus is telling you to be uh, naive and anti-intellectual. Okay, so he's saying that your faith in trusting him should be like a child, not that your intellectual development should be like a child. So, right, so Paul, for example, says, I pray that you increase in wisdom and knowledge. I pray that you become like strong children who can take, or uh, like adults who can eat meat and not like infants who drink milk, right? So um, it's Jesus is not saying be dumb and anti-intellectual. Fumple's $3. Jay, have you... Uh, I've seen you speak of many things, but have you ever spoke about theories of the Titanic? Um, I don't know much about that, but in one of the episodes of uh, Hollywood Decoded, uh, Jay Wiener gave all of his analysis of the Titanic. So, so we in the Titanic episode, yes, he covered that, but I don't know much about that conspiracy. Um, Crypto God is $3. How many church fathers had different canons when Augustine said the canon was closed in his time? Right, so when Augustine uh, and the uh, Western, and so Augustine and the Pope essentially discussed what they thought was the canon and included the, the Deuterocanon. But from the Orthodox perspective, we would see that as kind of a normative um, Latin representation of what they thought the canon was at their time. But Augustine and the Pope doesn't mean that it's universal, right? So for the Orthodox Church, we would say that's a good attestation to the inclusion of the Deuterocanon that Augustine and the Pope at his, in his day accepted the Deuterocanon and had a canon basically what similar to what would be the canon that the Orthodox Church ends up accepting at Trollo and thus by extension at the Sixth Council. So Trollo and then the Sixth Council kind of list what for the Orthodox Church is the normative canon of Scripture. And for all intents and purposes, it's pretty much identical to what Augustine and the Pope uh, in his day thought was the canon. So um, that's how we see those uh, those Western councils in terms of in Augustine's day and the canon. Um, but just because Augustine and the Pope said that it's, quote, closed, I'm not even sure they said it's closed. They just gave the list, right? And it, it comes up in Denzinger. So, um, but you, you, you see how, uh, depending on whether you're a papist or whether you believe in the, the supreme authority being an ecumenical council is going to determine how you would answer this question. Does that make sense? Right. So, the, so the Roman Catholic is going to say, oh, uh, 
we just look to the 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 you know papal council uh that listed the canon and that settles it for us uh and then for the orthodox it's going to be a little bit different i was trying to find a specific denzinger statement where it comes up I know it's listed in Denzinger, but I can't remember off the top of my head which one it is. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Augustine, the authority of Augustine. So this would be post Augustine. So. Oh, I know. It'll be. If I look, if I look up canon, it'll be this is canon of scripture. Sources of Revelation. I can't even read this, dude. Books of the Testaments. Here we go. 32, 84, 92. Probably one of those. So let's see. I can't remember the exact date, so that's what I'm trying to see what it says. Is it, here we go. Yeah, Council of Rome. So in Denzinger, it is... Damasus, Denzinger, 58. Uh, yeah, well, actually, it's not. It starts in 58, and then it goes over to 84. Okay, so Denzinger, 84, is a uh, decree of Pope Damasus, the Roman Synod. And it lists the uh, scriptures and includes the Deuterocanon. So in, that would have been normative in, in the West. But you'll notice that you don't find Eastern fathers after this saying, oh, I uh, wonder what the canon is. Uh, let's all just ask Damasus, right? Wouldn't they, have, wouldn't they have done that if they believed in papal supremacy? Wouldn't everybody have just said, well, uh, no, we'll, we'll never know what the canon is until Rome makes that decision. Oh, and by the way, uh, every, we all know that Rome made the decision in 382, right? Did anybody do that? No. Why? If Roman primacy, in, if Roman supremacy is true and was true at this time, why didn't the Six Ecumenical Council just say, this was determined long ago. This was determined uh, in D Denzinger. <laughs> I'm making a joke, Roman Catholics. Uh, right? Wouldn't they just say, uh, Denzinger 84 settled this uh, centuries ago? But no, for us, you get up into the time of Trollo and the Sixth Council. But again, this is actually an attestation to unanimity about, for the most part, the canon. Right? So the, the West, the East, takes about six centuries, says, hey, this is our list of scriptures. This is it. We agree. But the actual history of that, in my view, disproves the whole Vatican One view. Um, crypto Goddess One Dollar. Do you have thoughts on uh, Augustine saying councils get that? Well, hold on. He says councils can get things wrong, but does he say ecumenical councils can get things wrong? Uh, I'd have to see that quote again. I mean, I, d I know that he has these quotes that are quote mind and use, but I'd have to see the full quote. So I don't remember off the top of my head this the source for that, but. Um, I mean, we think Augustine got plenty of things wrong. So, um, sure. Uh, I don't have a problem saying that uh, if he th if he thinks general councils erred, then I would say he's wrong. Crypto got us $3. How come you don't interact with uh, Jewish and Islamic philosophy? Uh, we have interacted with uh, both of them many times. Uh, I mean, I have a thousand videos going back 10 years. So, and articles. Um, we only had one... Jewish guy who wanted to do a debate, Duvid, and he only wanted to debate masonry, which I don't care about debating that. So, um, in terms of Islamic philosophy, uh, Orthodox Shahada, who we do a lot of work with, um, they cover that extensively 
and I have shared their stuff. Uh, we've debated four Muslims, and we touch on uh, some of the people that you list. Um, but yeah, I don't actually find those people very convincing. Uh, I've read uh, Guy Guy of the Perplexed uh, by Maimonides, and so I can, but nobody ever brings that up. You're the first person to bring up uh, Ram Bam in probably five years. Would you beat John Calvin in a debate? Uh, well, it depends on what we were debating. I mean, John Calvin um, was a was a Renaissance humanist scholar, and Renaissance humanism is not the same thing as like secular humanism. Renaissance humanism was the idea that you needed to cultivate learning the original languages, go back to the ancient texts. So in terms of like Greek or Hebrew, John Calvin would beat me in a debate. Um, however, in terms of a Trinitarian theology, I don't think John Calvin would beat me in a debate. Crypto goddess, $1. Do you have thoughts on Justin Martyr saying uh, the beginning of the sun is an act of will? Again, I'd like to see the quote. I'm not saying that um, you're wrong. Um, there's dispute and debate over what Justin means in a couple of those Trinitarian texts. Um, but again, I don't have a problem saying that um, this or that church father made errors. I think Augustine made errors. I think St. Gregory of Nyssa made errors. I think Justin Martyr made errors. I think St. Irenaeus made errors. Uh, I was just reading Stan Eloy the other day. I think he made an error. Uh, so, you know, th there's no saints even that are immune to making mistakes. Um, but, you know, the difference between a saint and a heretic is not just being wrong. It's the attitude that one has to the error. Uh, are they pernicious and obstinate in the error? Do they try to convince everybody of their error? Or do they make a bad statement or an unclear statement in passing? Or is it a translation issue? I don't know. Elias, $10. Thank you for another great live stream. Thank you, Elias. Much appreciated. Nectaria, $50. Thank you so much for that, Nectaria. Uh, that's a fat super chat. She wins the super chat of the night. Uh, one last dude, Rob. Rob had something to say. He's got umlauts, so I'm a little nervous. Rube. What's up, Rob? Unmute. Oh. oh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. How you doing? All right. Well, thanks so much for taking my call. Right. Well, my questions are actually quite simple. Okay. So I'll just say them, and I just would like to hear uh, what's wrong with natural theology. Not that I support it. It's just I hear you are very critical with it. So I'd like to know uh, why. Uh, what's wrong with it? Right. So it really depends on what we mean by those terms. And so, for example, uh, in the Trent debate, what I did was specify to Trent that the debate would be the Roman Catholic definition of what natural theology is, according to John Paul II's encyclical Fides, Fides et Ratio. And in Fides et Ratio, John Paul II defines it as the autonomous reasoning of man apart from any reference to divine revelation. If you look at the Blackwell definition of natural theology that uh, William Lane Craig is the editor of, that big fat book, the first page defines it in much the same way. So simply put, I don't think there is such a thing as autonomous reasoning of man that is able to achieve any kind of grounding apart from revelation. Okay, pretty concise definition. Thanks. I was just because I saw that debate with Trent. And of course, he was appealing to Romans, right, to make his, his case. And of course, you were, I think, yeah, but uh, where in Romans is there a syllogism, right? So for them, they think that Romans is talking about, uh, you know, Aristotelian syllogisms and uh, these uh, ex these uh, elaborate causal arguments. There's nothing like that in Romans 1. In fact, it's the opposite of what they think it is. Paul says that every man is accountable and uh, is susceptible to rebellion against God due to the fall. So there's nothing about an intellectual deficiency in a reasoning process Romans 1 is about the heart of man, the noose, that man's problem is not intellectual, it's not epistemological, it's noetic, a.k.a. his heart. That's what that's what Romans 1 is about, not their uh, abstract and intellectual reasoning process. Yeah. I hear you. All right, second question, then I'm done. Thanks again for uh -huh. taking my call. Sure. By the way, uh, if all anybody needs to do to understand is uh, read uh, St. Justin Popovich's chapter in his book, Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ, it critiquing and saying why we don't believe in natural theology. So, I, I mean, just following St. Justin Popovich in his line of reasoning as to why we don't. Cool. I will definitely take you up on that recommendation. Final question. 
you champion the transcendental argument, right? So sure. I'm because I'm kind of old school in my thinking. I'm Orthodox, but uh, I'm not as knowledgeable on all this as, as you. So uh, I, I've always been persuaded by the cosmological argument. What what makes the transcendental argument more? I mean, the superior argument, if it is, if you get what I'm asking. Sure. So I think that in a time period uh, when people didn't question things that were seen as just sort of givens, uh, it makes sense to argue that way. The way that ancient and medieval philosophers and churchmen argued, they would argue, um, assuming that metaphysics was the case and everybody kind of operated like we start with metaphysics and they're just kind of givens. The problem is that the whole modern world after Descartes and especially after uh, Hume and Kant, they started asking questions that uh, doubt that assumption. So they started saying, well, wait a minute, if you're going to make all these metaphysical claims and if you're going to make ca claims about causality and all this, you're putting the cart before the horse because we don't know that you have uh, epistemic justification for the metaphysical beliefs that you have. So the whole modern world is premised on flipping the question uh, to ancient and medieval man and saying, okay, but before you make these arguments, you're going to have to give an account for these principles and the assumptions that you have behind these principles. So the reason that the transcendental argument is a better argument is not because there's no such thing as causation or no such thing as teleology. It's because it's a better, powerful way to respond to modern denials of fundamental principles. I got gotcha. you. Well, um, there are many more questions I can think of. Well, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, a one third one and then uh, three for three. Why is the uh, Catholic view of purgatory incompatible with the Orthodox view of the intermediate state? And that will be my final question. Well, I will rep I'll reply with St. Mark of Ephesus' reply after the Council of Florence where he said there is no created fire of God. All right. <laughs> well, that, well that, put, that puts an end to that, no, doesn't it? Well, I appreciate your time. Sure. Yeah, good questions. Have a great night. Uh-huh, you too. All right, that looks like the last one, but we got a couple more super chats here from uh, Caroline S. Have you seen the discussion that Pajot, Jordan Peterson, and Verveke recently had? Uh, I have not. It went into a very exciting direction. They seem to be fleshing out a vocabulary of and way of describing ideas leading to uh, orthodoxy for the modern mainstream. Sounds very cool, but no, I've not seen that. Um, if that does lead people to, uh, you know, getting into orthodoxy, I think that's great. Uh, but I've not seen that conversation. Crypto God is five dollars. He he ministers to the Father's will, and since he was gotten to the Father by an act of will, dialogue with Trifo, chapter sixty-one. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, that yeah, I would say that that's a problem. Although you could also point out that um, even though the generating of the Son is not primarily by will it's a generation of the father's nature um it is still the case that the father acquiesces to that so in other words it's not against his will so it's a an acquiescent will but it is not a a will it's not a choice that causes the son to be right because if there's an interposition of will as saint Gregory Nyssa says then the son would be a work and if the son's a work then the arians would be correct um, but yeah, so I, I've heard of that statement, um, in, uh, let's see, let me see if I can pull it up. Let's see. So dialogue with Trifo 61. There's a, I'm not a huge fan of Zizi Ulus, but he actually has a discussion of this that's not that's not that bad, um, where he talks about uh, so even so we we say that the so Saint Athanasius, for example, talks about the generating of the sun as an act. It's not an act by will though; it's an act of nature. But the father also doesn't go against the generating of the sun, so it's also in a sense willed. Does that make sense? So it, in other words. It, he wills it, but it's not an effect of will. Does that make sense? Like he, he acquiesces to that, but he doesn't cause it by his willing. Uh, let's see, 61. But I also, I also don't have a problem saying that um, St. Justin Martyr uh, got something wrong. So, so that's 
114. Let's go back. I read this like in 2005, so a lot of this I don't remember. I did read it though. I did read the apology and the dialogue. The apology and all the trifle of the Jew. Let's see, 60. Uh, uh, th by the way, there's another error I think he makes in chapter. It seems like I might be wrong about this, but it, doesn't he have a premillennial view? I just have a note here, but I don't really. It's, again, I, I read this. What well, was 2005? 17 years ago. Um, no, not 17 years. Or is it? Yeah. I read this 17 years ago. So a lot of this I don't remember. But I have a note that says St. Justin's premillennial error on chapter 80. So I think a couple uh, of the post apostolic fathers uh, seem to speak in a, in a millenarian way. And I think that's a mistake. Um, let's see. You said 61. Examples of the devil ripping off Christianity. Okay, let's see. The Septuagint. 63, let's see, 61. No, no, that's 71. Exciting. Uh, watch as he turns the page. The excitement. It's almost a... More than we can bear. Here we go. 61. The wisdom that is begotten of the Father. Okay, let's see. So the beginning, the Son who is the beginning, a begotten from Him, uh, a rational power proceeding from Him, also called the Spirit, the glory of the Lord, now the Son, the wisdom, the angel, then Lord and Logos, Appeared in human form, uh, appeared to Joshua. Note, by the way, that he's arguing that the Theophanies are the Son. Um, that's a, a constant argument he makes against this position. The word of the wisdom is the self begotten of the Father. The glory of the begetter will evidence to me when he speaks by Solomon. Okay. This is not that long. From everlasting establishment at the beginning, before he made the earth, before he made the depths, the springs. He begets me. Foundations of the earth. I was uh, that. So he's just quoting that long section from Proverbs. Okay, so I don't see the statement. I might have missed it. Let me go back. I don't see where it says that he was begotten by will. Let's see. Let's start over. I begat. Before all creatures of beginning, a certain rational power proceeding from him who is called the Holy Spirit, the glory of the Lord. Um, here we go. I see it. Let's see. Since he ministered to the Father's will and since he was begotten of the Father by an act of will. The note says the act of will. Act of will or volition. Is on the part of the Father. Yeah. So. So you'll note I did I read that many years ago I did make a note of it here and uh, if we wanted to rescue Justin and give him a charitable reading we would say that he was unclear uh, or that he expressed himself in an unclear way that later theology would clarify right the point that Zizilus makes that it's not strictly speaking um, the will that is the cause of the son but the, the father does will the natural begetting of the son. Crypto God is $5. Augustine, even if plenary councils earlier are often corrected by those which follow them, when by some actual experiment things are brought to light which were before concealed, and that which is known which previously lay hid. Yeah, I don't have a problem saying Augustine's wrong. Um, but can you give me this? Uh, like, I'm not saying it's not a, a correct quote, but I don't know the source of that. So um, what does 
But what does it prove that uh, Justin Martyr and Augustine got things wrong? I mean, if I if we thought that saints were infallible, that might be something problematic, right? But what makes a person a saint is not perfect theology. It's was he in the bosom of the church and did he submit? For example, you read on the Trinity in uh, book three or four, he says, I can't read the Greek fathers, so I submit my work to the judgment of the universal church. By the way, he doesn't say, I'll just send it to Rome and the Pope will decide, right? He says, I submit this to the judgment of the universal church. And if I got anything wrong, I welcome being corrected. Um, he also wrote uh, retractions towards the end of his life, which he did re not everything, but he did retract some things. It would have been nice if he retracted more, but um, so I'm not sure if like do Protestants or Muslims or well, I don't know what your position is. I mean, do you think that the orthodox perspective is that the saints become in some way infallible like they 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 don't make errors or mistakes i mean i think pretty much every church father has some kind of mistake somewhere especially the ones that wrote a lot right but some of them some of them the mistakes are so significant that they're no longer in the church right so you said uh crypto goddess book two chapter three of on baptism on baptism against the donatists Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. I don't doubt you. I'm sure he did say that, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I we don't believe that general counsels err in theology. So Augustine's wrong. All right, everybody. Uh, every, if you would, uh, hit like and share much appreciated for all the